Section zero of an essay concerning human understanding by John Locke, book four of Knowledge and Probability. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Of Knowledge and Probability, Synopsis of the Fourth Book. Locke's review of the different sorts of ideas or appearances of what exists that can be entertained in a human understanding and of their relations to words leads in the fourth book to an investigation of the extent and validity of the knowledge that our ideas bring within our reach and into the nature of faith in probability by which assent is extended beyond knowledge for the conduct of life he finds chapters one and two that knowledge is either an intuitive a demonstrative or a sensuous perception of absolute certainty in regard to one or other of four sorts of agreement or disagreement on the part of ideas one of each idea within itself as identical and different from every other two in their abstract relations to one another three in their necessary connections as qualities and powers coexisting in concrete substances, and four, as revelations to us of the final realities of existence. The unconditional certainty that constitutes knowledge is perceptible by man only in regard to the first, second, and fourth of these four sorts, in all general propositions only in regard to the first and second. That is to say, in identical propositions and in those which express abstract relations of simple or mixed modes in which nominal and real essences coincide for example propositions in pure mathematics and abstract morality chapters three and five to eight the fourth sort which express certainty as to realities of existence refer to any of three realities for every man is able to perceive with absolute certainty that he himself exists that god must exist and that finite beings other than himself exist the first of these perceptions being awakened by all our ideas the second as the consequence of perception of the first and the last in the reception of our simple ideas of sense chapters one section seven two section fourteen 3 section 21 4 and 9 to 11 agreement of the third sort of necessary coexistence of simple ideas as qualities and powers in particular substances with which all physical inquiry is concerned lies beyond human knowledge for here the nominal and real essences are not coincident general propositions of this sort are determined by analogies of experience in judgments that are more or less probable intellectually necessary science of nature presupposes omniscience man's interpretations of nature have to turn upon presumptions of probability chapters three sections nine to seventeen four sections eleven to seventeen six and fourteen to sixteen in forming their stock of certainties and probabilities men employ the faculty of reason faith in divine revelation and enthusiasm chapters seventeen to nineteen much misled by the last as well as by other causes of wrong assent chapter twenty when they are at work in the three great provinces of the intellectual world chapter twenty one concerned respectively with one things as knowable physica two actions as they depend on us in order to happiness practica and three methods for interpreting the signs of what is and of what ought to be that are presented in our ideas and words logica end of section zero section one of an essay concerning human understanding by john locke book four of knowledge and probability this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami, M.D. Chapter 1 of Knowledge in General 1. Our Knowledge Conversant About Our Ideas Only since the mind in all its thoughts and reasonings hath no other immediate object but its own ideas which it alone does or can contemplate it is evident that our knowledge is only conversant about them two knowledge is the perception of the agreement or disagreement of two ideas knowledge then seems to me to be nothing but the perception of the connection of an agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas in this alone it consists where this perception is there is knowledge and where it is not there though we may fancy guess or believe yet we always come short of knowledge for when we know that white is not black what do we else but perceive that these two ideas do not agree when we possess ourselves with the utmost security of the demonstration that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones what do we more but perceive that equality to two right ones does necessarily agree to and is inseparable from the three angles of a triangle three this agreement or disagreement may be any of four sorts but to understand a little more distinctly wherein this agreement or disagreement consists i think we may reduce it all to these four sorts one identity or diversity two relation three coexistence or necessary connection four real existence four first of identity or diversity in ideas first as to the first sort of agreement or disagreement namely identity or diversity it is the first act of the mind when it has any sentiments or ideas at all to perceive its ideas and so far as it perceives them to know each what it is and thereby also to perceive their difference and that one is not another this is so absolutely necessary that without it there could be no knowledge no reasoning no imagination no distinct thoughts at all by this the mind clearly and infallibly perceives each idea to agree with itself and to be what it is and all distinct ideas to disagree that is the one not to be the other and this it does without pains labour or deduction but at first view by its natural power of perception and distinction and though men of art have reduced this into those general rules what is is and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be for ready application in all cases wherein there may be occasion to reflect on it yet it is certain that the first exercise of this faculty is about particular ideas a man infallibly knows as soon as ever he has them in his mind that the ideas he calls white and round are the very ideas they are and that they are not other ideas which he calls red or square nor can any maxim or proposition in the world make him know it clearer or surer than he did before and without any such general rule this then is the first agreement or disagreement which the mind perceives in its ideas which it always perceives at first sight and if there ever happen any doubt about it it will always be found to be about the names and not the ideas themselves whose identity and diversity will always be perceived as soon and clearly as the ideas themselves are nor can it possibly be otherwise five secondly of abstract relations between ideas secondly the next sort of agreement or disagreement the mind perceives in any of its ideas may i think be called relative and it is nothing but the perception of the relation between any two ideas of what kind soever whether substances modes or any other for since all distinct ideas must eternally be known not to be the same and so be universally and constantly denied one of another there could be no room for any positive knowledge at all if we could not perceive any relation between our ideas and find out the agreement or disagreement that they have with another in several ways the mind takes of comparing them six 
thirdly of their necessary coexistence in substances thirdly the third sort of agreement or disagreement to be found in our ideas which the perception of the mind is employed about is coexistence or non-coexistence in the same subject and this belongs particularly to substances thus when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed our knowledge of this truth amounts to no more than this that fixedness or a power to remain in the fire unconsumed is an idea that always accompanies and is joined with that particular sort of yellowness weight fusibility malleableness and solubility in aqua regia which makes our complex idea signified by the word gold seven fourthly of real existence agreeing to any idea fourthly the fourth and last sort is that of actual real existence agreeing to any idea within these four sorts of agreement or disagreement is i suppose contained all the knowledge we have or are capable of for all the inquiries we can make concerning any of our ideas all that we know or can affirm concerning any of them is that it is or is not the same with some other that it does or does not always coexist with some other idea in the same subject that it has this or that relation with some other idea or that it has a real existence without the mind thus blue is not yellow is of identity two triangles upon equal bases between two parallels are equal is of relation iron is susceptible of magnetical impressions is of coexistence god is is of real existence though identity and coexistence are truly nothing but relations yet they are such peculiar ways of agreement or disagreement of our ideas that they deserve well to be considered as distinct heads and not under relation in general since they are so different grounds of affirmation and negation as will easily appear to any one who will but reflect on what is said in several places of this essay i should now proceed to examine the several degrees of our knowledge but that it is necessary first to consider the different acceptations of the word knowledge eight knowledge is either actual or habitual there are several ways wherein the mind is possessed of truth each of which is called knowledge one there is actual knowledge which is the present view the mind has of the agreement or disagreement of any of its ideas or of the relation they have to one another two a man is said to know any proposition which having been once laid before his thoughts he evidently perceived the agreement or disagreement of the ideas whereof it consists and so lodged it in his memory that whenever that proposition comes again to be reflected on he without doubt or hesitation embraces the right side assents to and is certain of the truth of it this i think one may call habitual knowledge and thus a man may be said to know all those truths which are lodged in his memory by a foregoing clear and full perception whereof the mind is assured past doubt as often as it has occasion to reflect on them for our finite understandings being able to think clearly and distinctly but on one thing at once if men had no knowledge of any more than what they actually thought on they would all be very ignorant and he that knew most would know but one truth that being all he was able to think on at one time nine habitual knowledge is of two degrees of habitual knowledge there are also vulgarly speaking two degrees first the one is of such truths laid up in the memory as whenever they occur to the mind it actually perceives the relation is between those ideas and this is in all those truths whereof we have an intuitive knowledge where the ideas themselves by an immediate view discover their agreement or disagreement one with another secondly the other is of such truths whereof the mind having been convinced it retains the memory of the conviction without the proofs thus a man that remembers certainly that he once perceived the demonstration that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones is certain that he knows it because he cannot doubt the truth of it in his adherence to a truth where the demonstration by which it was at first known is forgot 
though a man may be thought rather to believe his memory than really to know and this way of entertaining a truth seemed formerly to me like something between opinion and knowledge a sort of assurance which exceeds bare belief for that relies on the testimony of another yet upon a due examination i find it comes not short of perfect certainty and is in effect true knowledge that which is apt to mislead our first thoughts into a mistake in this matter is that the agreement or disagreement of the ideas in this case is not perceived as it was at first by an actual view of all the intermediate ideas whereby the agreement or disagreement of those in the proposition was at first perceived but by other intermediate ideas that show the agreement or disagreement of the ideas contained in the proposition whose certainty we remember for example in this proposition that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones one who has seen and clearly perceived the demonstration of this truth knows it to be true when that demonstration is gone out of his mind so that at present it is not actually in view and possibly cannot be recollected but he knows it in a different way from what he did before the agreement of the two ideas joined in that proposition is perceived but it is by the intervention of other ideas than those which at first produced this perception he remembers that is he knows for remembrance is but the reviving of some past knowledge that he was once certain of the truth of this proposition that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones the immutability of the same relations between the same immutable things is now the idea that shows him that if the three angles of a triangle were once equal to two right ones they will always be equal to two right ones and hence he comes to be certain that what was once true in the case is always true what ideas once agreed will always agree and consequently what he once knew to be true he will always know to be true as long as he can remember that he once knew it upon this ground it is that particular demonstrations in mathematics afford general knowledge if then the perception that the same ideas will eternally have the same habitudes and relations be not a sufficient ground of knowledge there could be no knowledge of general propositions in mathematics for no mathematical demonstration would be any more than particular and when a man had demonstrated any proposition concerning one angle or circle his knowledge would not reach beyond that particular diagram if he would extend it further he must renew his demonstration in another instance before he could know it to be true in another like triangle and so on by which means one could never come to the knowledge of any general propositions nobody i think can deny that mr newton certainly knows any proposition that he now at any time reads in his book to be true though he has not in actual view that admirable chain of intermediate ideas whereby he at first discovered it to be true such a memory as that able to retain such a train of particulars may be well thought beyond the reach of human faculties when the very discovery perception and laying together that wonderful connection of ideas is found to surpass most readers comprehension but yet it is evident the author himself knows the proposition to be true remembering he once saw the connection of those ideas as certainly as he knows such a man wounded another remembering that he saw him run him through but because the memory is not always so clear as actual perception and does in all men more or less decay in length of time this amongst other differences is one which shows that demonstrative knowledge is much more imperfect than intuitive as we shall see in the following chapter end of section one section two of an essay concerning human understanding by john locke book four of knowledge and probability this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by jennifer henry chapter two of the degrees of our knowledge one of the degrees or differences in clearness of our knowledge one intuitive all our knowledge consisting as i have said 
in the view the mind has of its own ideas, which is the utmost light and greatest certainty we, with our faculties and in our way of knowledge, are capable of, it may not be amiss to consider a little the degrees of its evidence. The different clearness of our knowledge seems to me to lie in the different way of perception the mind has of the agreement or disagreement of any of its ideas. For if we will reflect on our own ways of thinking, we will find that sometimes the mind perceives the agreement or disagreement of two ideas immediately by themselves, without the intervention of any other. And this I think we may call intuitive knowledge. For in this the mind is at no pains of proving or examining, but perceives the truth as the eye doth light, only by being directed towards it. Thus the mind perceives that white is not black, that a circle is not a triangle, that three are more than two and equal to one and two. Such kinds of truths the mind perceives at the first sight of the ideas together by bare intuition without the intervention of any other idea. And this kind of knowledge is the clearest and most certain that human frailty is capable of. This part of knowledge is irresistible and, like bright sunshine, forces itself immediately to be perceived as soon as ever the mind turns its view that way and leaves no room for hesitation, doubt, or examination. But the mind is presently filled with the clear light of it it is on this intuition that depends all the certainty and evidence of all our knowledge, which certainty everyone finds to be so great that he cannot imagine and therefore not require a greater. For a man cannot conceive himself capable of a greater certainty than to know that any idea in his mind is such as he perceives it to be, and that two ideas wherein he perceives a difference are different and not precisely the same. He that demands a greater certainty than this demands he knows not what and shows only that he has a mind to be a skeptic without being able to be so. Certainty depends so wholly on this intuition that in the next degree of knowledge, which I call demonstrative, this intuition is necessary in all the connections of the intermediate ideas without which we cannot attain knowledge and certainty. 2. 2. Demonstrative. The next degree of knowledge is where the mind perceives the agreement or disagreement of any ideas, but not immediately, though wherever the mind perceives the agreement or disagreement of any of its ideas, there be certain knowledge. Yet it does not always happen that the mind sees that agreement or disagreement which there is between them, even where it is discoverable, and in that case remains in ignorance and at most gets no further than a probable conjecture. The reason why the mind cannot always perceive presently the agreement or disagreement of two ideas is because those ideas concerning whose agreement or disagreement the inquiry is made cannot by the mind be so put together as to show it. In this case, then, when the mind cannot so bring its ideas together as by their immediate comparison and as it were juxtaposition or application one to another to perceive their agreement or disagreement, it is fain by the intervention of other ideas, one or more as it happens, to discover the agreement or disagreement which it searches. And this is that which we call reasoning. Thus the mind being willing to know the agreement or disagreement in bigness between the three angles of a triangle and two right ones cannot by an immediate view and comparing them do it, because the three angles of a triangle cannot be brought at once and be compared with any other one or two angles. And so of this the mind has no immediate, no intuitive knowledge. In this case, the mind is fain to find out some other angles to which the three angles of a triangle have an equality, and finding those equal to two right ones, comes to know their equality to two right ones. 3. Demonstration depends on clearly perceived proofs. Those intervening ideas which serve to show the agreement of any two others are called proofs. 
and where the agreement and disagreement is by this means plainly and clearly perceived, it is called demonstration, it being shown to the understanding and the mind made to see that it is so. A quickness in the mind to find out these intermediate ideas that shall discover the agreement or disagreement of any other, and to apply them right is, I suppose, that which is called sagacity. 4. As certain, but not so easy and ready as intuitive knowledge. This knowledge, by intervening proofs, though it be certain, yet the evidence of it is not altogether so clear and bright, nor the assent so ready as in intuitive knowledge. For though in demonstration the mind does at last perceive the agreement or disagreement of the ideas it considers, yet it is not without pains and attention. There must be more than one transient view to find it. A steady application and pursuit are required to this discovery, and there must be a progression by steps and degrees before the mind can, in this way, arrive at certainty, and come to perceive the agreement or repugnancy between two ideas that need proofs and the use of reason to show it. 5. The demonstrated conclusion, not without doubt, precedent to the demonstration. Another difference between intuitive and demonstrative knowledge is that, though in the latter all doubt be removed when, by the intervention of the intermediate ideas, the agreement or disagreement is perceived, yet before the demonstration there was a doubt, which, in intuitive knowledge, cannot happen to the mind that has its faculty of perception left to a degree capable of distinct ideas no more than it can be a doubt to the eye that can distinctly see white and black whether this ink and this paper be all of a colour if there be sight in the eyes it will at first glimpse without hesitation perceive the words printed on this paper different from the colour of the paper and so if the mind have the faculty of distinct perception it will perceive the agreement or disagreement of those ideas that produce intuitive knowledge if the eyes have lost the faculty of seeing or the mind of perceiving we in vain inquire after the quickness of sight in one or clearness of perception in the other six not so clear as intuitive knowledge it is true the perception produced by demonstration is also very clear, yet it is often with a great abatement of that evident luster and full assurance that always accompany that which I call intuitive, like a face reflected by several mirrors one to another, where as long as it retains the similitude and agreement with the object, it produces a knowledge, but it is still, in every successive reflection, with a lessening of that perfect clearness and distinctness which is in the first, till at last, after many removes, it has a great mixture of dimness and is not at first sight so knowable, especially to weak eyes. Thus it is with knowledge made out by a long train of proof. 7. Each step in demonstrated knowledge must have intuitive evidence. Now, in every step reason makes in demonstrative knowledge, there is an intuitive knowledge of that agreement or disagreement it seeks with the next intermediate idea which it uses as a proof. For if it were not so, that yet would need a proof, since without the perception of such agreement or disagreement, there is no knowledge produced. If it be perceived by itself, it is intuitive knowledge. If it cannot be perceived by itself, there is need of some intervening idea, as a common measure, to show their agreement or disagreement, by which it is plain that every step in reasoning that produces knowledge has intuitive certainty, which, when the mind perceives, there is no more required but to remember it, to make the agreement or disagreement of the ideas concerning which we inquire visible and certain, so that, to make anything a demonstration, it is necessary to perceive the immediate agreement of the intervening ideas, whereby the agreement or disagreement of the two ideas under examination, whereof the one is always the first, and the other the last in the account, is found. 
This intuitive perception of the agreement or disagreement of the intermediate ideas in each step and progression of the demonstration must also be carried exactly in the mind, and a man must be sure that no part is left out, which, because in long deductions and the use of many proofs, the memory does not always so readily and exactly retain, therefore it comes to pass that this is more imperfect than intuitive knowledge, and men embrace often falsehood for demonstrations. 8. Hence the mistake, ex precognitus et preconcessis. The necessity of this intuitive knowledge in each step of scientifical or demonstrative reasoning gave occasion, I imagine, to that mistaken axiom that all reasoning was ex precognitus et preconcessis, which, how far it is a mistake, I shall have occasion to show more at large when I come to consider propositions, and particularly those propositions which are called maxims, and to show that it is by a mistake that they are supposed to be the foundations of all our knowledge and reasonings. 9. Demonstration not limited to ideas of mathematical quantity. It has been generally taken for granted that mathematics alone are capable of demonstrative certainty, but to have such an agreement or disagreement as may intuitively be perceived, being, as I imagine, not the privilege of the ideas of number, extension, and figure alone, it may possibly be the want of due method and application in us, and not of sufficient evidence in things, that demonstration has been thought to have so little to do in other parts of knowledge, and been scarce so much as aimed at by any but mathematicians. For whatever ideas we have wherein the mind can perceive the immediate agreement or disagreement that is between them, there the mind is capable of intuitive knowledge. And where it can perceive the agreement or disagreement of any two ideas, by an intuitive perception of the agreement or disagreement they have with any intermediate ideas, there the mind is capable of demonstration, which is not limited to ideas of extension, figure, number, and their modes. 10. Why it has been thought to be so limited. The reason why it has been generally sought for and supposed to be only in those, I imagine, has been not only the general usefulness of those sciences, but because in comparing their equality or excess, the modes of numbers have every the least difference very clear and perceivable. And though in extension every the least excess is not so perceptible, yet the mind has found out ways to examine and discover demonstratively the just equality of two angles or extensions or figures. And both these, i.e. numbers and figures, can be set down by visible and lasting marks, wherein the ideas under consideration are perfectly determined which, for the most part, they are not where they are marked only by names and words. 11. Modes of qualities not demonstrable like modes of quantity. But in other simple ideas, whose modes and differences are made and counted by degrees and not quantity, we have not so nice and accurate a distinction of their differences as to perceive or find ways to measure their just equality or the least differences. For those other simple ideas, being appearances of sensations produced in us by the size, figure, number, and motion of minute corpuscles singly insensible, their different degrees also depend on the variation of some or all those causes, which, since it cannot be observed by us in particles of matter, whereof each is too subtle to be perceived, it is impossible for us to have any exact measures of the different degrees of these simple ideas. For supposing the sensation or idea we name whiteness be produced in us by a certain number of globules, which, having a verticity about their own centers, strike upon the retina of the eye with a certain degree of rotation, as well as progressive swiftness, 
it will hence easily follow that the more the superficial parts of any body are so ordered as to reflect the greater number of globules of light and to give them the proper rotation which is fit to produce this sensation of white in us the more white will that body appear that from an equal space sends to the retina the greater number of such corpuscles with that particular sort of motion i do not say that the nature of light consists in very small round globules nor of whiteness in such a texture of parts as gives a certain rotation to these globules when it reflects them for i am not now treating physicality of light or colors but this i think i may say that i cannot and i would be glad any one would make intelligible that he did conceive how bodies without us can any ways affect our senses but by the immediate contact of the sensible bodies themselves as in tasting and feeling or the impulse of some sensible particles coming from them as in seeing hearing and smelling by the different impulse of which parts caused by their different size figure and motion the variety of sensations is produced in us twelve particles of light and simple ideas of color whether then they be globules or no or whether they have a verticity about their own centers that produces the idea of whiteness in us this is certain that the more particles of light are reflected from a body fitted to give them that peculiar motion which produces the sensation of whiteness in us and possibly too the quicker that peculiar motion is the whiter does the body appear from which the greatest number are reflected as is evident in the same piece of paper put in the sunbeams in the shade and in a dark hole in each of which it will produce in us the idea of whiteness in far different degrees. 13. The secondary qualities of things not discovered by demonstration. Not knowing, therefore, what number of particles nor what motion of them is fit to produce any precise degree of whiteness, we cannot demonstrate the certain equality of any two degrees of whiteness because we have no certain standard to measure them by, nor means to distinguish every the least real difference, the only help we have being from our senses, which in this point fail us. But where the difference is so great as to produce in the mind clearly distinct ideas, whose differences can be perfectly retained, there these ideas, or colors, as we see in different kinds as blue and red are as capable of demonstration as ideas of number and extension what i have here said of whiteness and colors i think holds true in all secondary qualities and their modes fourteen three sensitive knowledge of the particular existence of finite beings without us these two these intuition and demonstration are the degrees of our knowledge whatever comes short of one of these with what assurance soever embraced is but faith or opinion but not knowledge at least in all general truths there is indeed another perception of the mind employed about the particular existence of finite beings without us which going beyond bare probability and yet not reaching perfectly to either of the foregoing degrees of certainty passes under the name of knowledge there can be nothing more certain than that the idea we receive from an external object is in our minds this is intuitive knowledge but whether there be anything more than barely that idea in our minds whether we can thence certainly infer the existence of anything without us which corresponds to that idea is that whereof some men think there may be a question made because men may have such ideas in their minds when no such thing exists no such object affects their senses but yet here i think we are provided with an evidence that puts us past doubting for i ask any one whether he be not invincibly conscious to himself of a different perception when he looks on the sun by day and thinks on it by night 
when he actually tastes wormwood or smells a rose or only thinks on that savor or odor, we as plainly find the difference there is between any idea revived in our minds by our own memory and actually coming into our minds by our senses, as we do between any two distinct ideas. If anyone say, a dream may do the same thing, and all these ideas may be produced in us without any external objects, he may be pleased to dream that I make him this answer. 1. That it is no great matter whether I remove his scruple or no, where all is but dream, reasoning and arguments are of no use. Truth and knowledge, nothing. 2. That I believe he will allow a very manifest difference between dreaming of being in the fire and being actually in it. But yet, if he be resolved to appear so skeptical as to maintain that what I call being actually in the fire is nothing but a dream, and that we cannot thereby certainly know that any such thing as fire actually exists without us, I answer that we certainly, finding that pleasure or pain follows upon the application of certain objects to us, whose existence we perceive or dream that we perceive by our senses, this certainty is as great as our happiness or misery, beyond which we have no concernment to know or to be. So that, I think we may add to the two former sorts of knowledge, this also, of the existence of particular external objects, by that perception and consciousness we have of the actual entrance of ideas from them, and allow these three degrees of knowledge, viz. intuitive, demonstrative, and sensitive, in each of which there are different degrees and ways of evidence and certainty. 15. Knowledge not always clear where the ideas that enter into it are clear. But since our knowledge is founded on and employed about our ideas only, will it not follow from thence that it is conformable to our ideas? and that where our ideas are clear and distinct, or obscure and confused, our knowledge will be so too? To which I answer, no. For our knowledge, consisting in the perception of the agreement or disagreement of any two ideas, its clearness or obscurity consists in the clearness or obscurity of that perception, and not in the clearness or obscurity of the ideas themselves. V. G. A man that has as clear ideas of the angles of a triangle and of equality to two right ones as any mathematician in the world may yet have but a very obscure perception of their agreement, and so have but a very obscure knowledge of it. But ideas which, by reason of their obscurity or otherwise, are confused, cannot produce any clear or distinct knowledge because, as far as any ideas are confused, so far the mind cannot perceive clearly whether they agree or disagree. Or to express the same thing in a way less apt to be misunderstood, he that hath not determined ideas to the words he uses cannot make propositions of them of whose truth he can be certain. End of section 2. Recording by Jennifer Henry. Section 3 of An Essay Concerning Human Understanding by John Locke, Book 4 of Knowledge and Probability. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Bennett. Chapter 3 Of the Extent of Human Knowledge. 1. Extent of Our Knowledge. Knowledge, as has been said, lying in the perception of the agreement or disagreement of any of our ideas, it follows from hence that, first, it extends no further than we have ideas. First, we can have knowledge no further than we have ideas. Two, secondly, it extends no further than we can perceive their agreement or disagreement. Secondly, that we can have no knowledge further than we can have perception of that agreement or disagreement which perception being, one, either by intuition, 
or the immediate comparing any two ideas, or two, by reason, examining the agreement or disagreement of two ideas by the intervention of some others, or three, by sensation, perceiving the existence of particular things. Hence, it also follows, three, thirdly, intuitive knowledge extends itself not to all the relation of all our ideas. Thirdly, that we cannot have an intuitive knowledge that shall extend itself to all our ideas and all that we would know about them, because we cannot examine and perceive all the relations they have one to another by juxtaposition or an immediate comparison one with another. Thus, having the ideas of an obtuse and an acute angled triangle, both drawn from equal bases, and between parallels, I can, by intuitive knowledge, perceive the one not to be the other, but cannot that way know whether they be equal or no, because their agreement or disagreement in equality can never be perceived by an immediate comparing them. The difference of figure makes their parts incapable of an exact immediate application, and therefore there is need of some intervening qualities to measure them by, which is demonstration or rational knowledge. 4. Fourthly, nor does demonstrative knowledge. Fourthly, it follows also from what is above observed that our rational knowledge cannot reach to the whole extent of our ideas, because between two different ideas we would examine, we cannot always find such mediums as we can connect to one another with an intuitive knowledge in all the parts of the deduction. And wherever that fails, we come short of knowledge and demonstration. 5. Fifthly, sensitive knowledge narrower than either. Fifthly, sensitive knowledge reaching no further than the existence of things actually present to our senses is yet much narrower than either of the former. 6. Sixthly, our knowledge therefore narrower than our ideas. Sixthly, from all which it is evident that the extent of our knowledge comes not only short of the reality of things, but even of the extent of our own ideas. Though our knowledge be limited to our ideas and cannot exceed them either in extent or perfection, and though these be very narrow bounds in respect of the extent of all being, and far short of what we may justly imagine to be in some even created understandings, not tied down to the dull and narrow information that is to be received from some few and not very acute ways of perception, such as are our senses, yet it would be well with us if our knowledge were but as large as our ideas, and there were not many doubts and inquiries concerning the ideas we have, whereof we are not, nor, I believe, ever shall be in this world resolved. Nevertheless, I do not question but that human knowledge under the present circumstances of our beings and constitutions may be carried much further than it has hitherto been if men would sincerely and with freedom of mind employ all that industry and labor of thought in improving the means of discovering truth which they do for the coloring or support of falsehood to maintain a system, interest, or party they are once engaged in. But yet, after all, I think I may, without injury to human perfection, be confident that our knowledge would never reach to all we might desire to know concerning those ideas we have, nor be able to surmount all the difficulties and resolve all the questions that might arise concerning any of them. We have the ideas of a square, a circle, and equality, and yet perhaps shall never be able to find a circle equal to a square, and certainly know that it is so. We have the ideas of matter and thinking, but possibly shall never be able to know whether any mere material being thinks or no. It being impossible for us by the contemplation of our own ideas without revelation to discover where omnipotency has not given to some systems of matter fitly disposed a power to perceive and think, or else joined and fixed to matter so disposed, a thinking immaterial substance. It being, in respect of our notions, not much more remote from our comprehension to conceive that God can, if he pleases, superadd to matter a faculty of thinking, than he should superadd to it another substance with a faculty of thinking. Since we know not wherein thinking consists, nor to what sort of substances the Almighty has been pleased to give that power, 
which cannot be in any created being, but merely by the good pleasure and bounty of the Creator. For I see no contradiction in it, that the first eternal thinking being, or omnipotent spirit, should, if he pleased, give to certain systems of created senseless matter, put together as he thinks fit, some degrees of sense, perception, and thought, though, as I think I have proved, it is no less than a contradiction to suppose matter, which is evidently in its own nature void of sense and thought, should be that eternal first thinking being. What certainty of knowledge can any one have that some perceptions, such as, v.g., pleasure and pain, should not be in some bodies themselves after a certain manner modified and moved, as well as that they should be in an immaterial substance upon the motion of the parts of the body? Body, as far as we can conceive, being able only to strike and affect body, and motion, according to the utmost reach of our ideas, being able to produce nothing but motion, so that when we allow it to produce pleasure or pain, or the idea of a color or sound, we are fain to quit our reason, go beyond our ideas, and attribute it wholly to the good pleasure of our Maker. For, since we must allow he has annexed effects to motion, which we can no way conceive motion able to produce, what reason have we to conclude that he could not order them as well to be produced in a subject we cannot conceive capable of them, as well as in a subject we cannot conceive the motion of matter can any way operate upon? I say not this, that I would any way lessen the belief of the soul's immateriality. I am not here speaking of probability, but knowledge, and I think not only that it becomes the modesty of philosophy, not to pronounce magisterially, where we want that evidence that can produce knowledge, but also that it is of use to us to discern how far our knowledge does reach. For the state we are at present in, not being that of vision, we must in many things content ourselves with faith and probability, and in the present question about the immateriality of the soul. If our faculties cannot arrive at demonstrative certainty, we need not think it strange." All the great ends of morality and religion are well enough secured without philosophical proofs of the soul's immateriality, since it is evident that he who made us at the beginning to subsist here, sensible, intelligent beings, and for several years continued us in such a state, can and will restore us to the like state of sensibility in another world, and make us capable there to receive the retribution he has designed to men, according to their doings in this life and therefore it is not of such mighty necessity to determine one way or the other, as some, overzealous for or against the immateriality of the soul, have been forward to make the world believe. Who, either on one side indulging too much their thoughts immersed altogether in matter, can allow no existence to what is not material, or who, on the other side, finding not cogitation within the natural powers of matter, examined over and over again by the utmost intention of mind, have the confidence to conclude that omnipotency itself cannot give perception and thought to a substance which has the modification of solidity. He that considers how hardly sensation is, in our thoughts reconcilable to extended matter, or existence to anything that has no extension at all, will confess that he is very far from certainly knowing what his soul is. It is a point which seems to me to be put out of the reach of our knowledge, and he who will give himself leave to consider freely and look into the dark and intricate part of each hypothesis will scarce find his reason able to determine him fixedly for or against the soul's materiality. Since on which side soever he views it, either as an unextended substance or as a thinking extended matter, the difficulty to conceive either will, whilst either alone is in his thoughts, still drive him to the contrary side. An unfair way which some men take with themselves, who, because of the inconceivableness of something they find in one, throw themselves violently into the contrary hypothesis, though altogether as unintelligible to an unbiased understanding. This serves not only to show the weakness and the scantiness of our knowledge, but the insignificant triumph of such sort of arguments, which, drawn from our own views, may satisfy us that we can find no certainty on one side of the question. 
but do not at all thereby help us to truth by running into the opposite opinion, which, on examination, will be found clogged with equal difficulties. For what safety, what advantage to any one is it for the avoiding the seeming absurdities and to him unsurmountable rubs he meets with in one opinion to take refuge in the contrary, which is built on something altogether as inexplicable and as far remote from his comprehension? It is past controversy that we have in us something that thinks our very doubts about what it is confirm the certainty of its being, though we must content ourselves in the ignorance of what kind of being it is, and it is in vain to go out to be skeptical in this, as it is unreasonable in most other cases to be positive against the being of anything, because we cannot comprehend its nature. For I would fain know what substance exists that has not something in it which manifestly baffles our understandings. Other spirits who see and know the nature and inward constitution of things, how much must they exceed us in knowledge? To which, if we had larger comprehension, which enables them at one glance to see the connection and agreement of very many ideas, and readily supplies to them the intermediate proofs which we, by single and slow steps, and long pouring in the dark, hardly at last find out, and are often ready to forget one before we have hunted out another. We may guess at some part of the happiness of superior ranks of spirits who have a quicker and more penetrating sight as well as a larger field of knowledge. But to return to the argument in hand, our knowledge, I say, is not only limited to the paucity and imperfections of the ideas we have and which we employ it about, but even comes short of that too. But how far it reaches, let us now inquire. 7. How far our knowledge reaches. The affirmations or negations we make concerning the ideas we have may, as I have before intimated in general, be reduced to these four sorts, viz. identity, coexistence, relation, and real existence. I shall examine how far our knowledge extends in each of these. 8. Firstly, our knowledge of identity and diversity in ideas extends as far as our ideas themselves. First, as to identity and diversity. In this way of agreement or disagreement of our ideas, our intuitive knowledge is as far extended as our ideas themselves, and there can be no idea in the mind which it does not, presently, by an intuitive knowledge, perceive to be what it is and to be different from any other. 9. Secondly, of their coexistence extends only a very little way. Secondly, as to the second sort, which is the agreement or disagreement of our ideas in coexistence, in this our knowledge is very short, though in this consists the greatest and most material part of our knowledge concerning substances. For our ideas of the species of substances being, as I have showed, nothing but certain collections of simple ideas united in one subject, and so coexisting together, v.g., our idea of flame is a body hot, luminous, and moving upward, of gold, a body heavy to a certain degree, yellow, malleable, and fusible. For these, or some such complex ideas as these, in men's minds, do these two names of the different substances, flame and gold, stand for. When we would know anything further concerning these, or any other sort of substances, what do we inquire but what other qualities or powers these substances have or have not? Which is nothing else but to know what other simple ideas do or do not coexist with those that make up that complex idea? 10. Because the connection between simple ideas and substances is for the most part unknown. This, how weighty and considerable a part soever of human science is yet very narrow, and scarce any at all. The reason whereof is that the simple ideas whereof our complex ideas of substances are made up are, for the most part, such as carry with them in their own nature no visible necessary connection or inconsistency with any other simple ideas whose coexistence with them we would inform ourselves about. 11. Especially of the secondary qualities of bodies. The ideas that our complex ones of substances are made up of and about which our knowledge concerning substances is most employed 
are those of their secondary qualities, which, depending all, as has been shown, upon the primary qualities of their minute and insensible parts, or, if not upon them, upon something yet more remote from our comprehension, it is impossible we should know which have a necessary union or inconsistency one with another. For, not knowing the root they spring from, not knowing what size, figure, and texture of parts they are, on which depend and from which result those qualities which make our complex idea of gold, it is impossible we should know what other qualities result from or are incompatible with the same constitution of the insensible parts of gold, and so consequently must always coexist with that complex idea we have of it or else are inconsistent with it. 12. Because necessary connection between any secondary and the primary qualities is undiscoverable by us. Besides this ignorance of the primary qualities of the insensible parts of bodies, on which depend all their secondary qualities, there is yet another and more incurable part of ignorance which sets us more remote from a certain knowledge of the coexistence or incoexistence, if I may so say, of different ideas in the same subject, and that is that there is no discoverable connection between any secondary quality and those primary qualities which it depends on. 13. We have no perfect knowledge of their primary qualities. That the size, figure, and motion of one body should cause a change in the size, figure, and motion of another body is not beyond our conception. The separation of the parts of one body upon the intrusion of another, and the change from rest to motion upon impulse, these and the like seem to have some connection one with another, and if we knew these primary qualities of bodies, we might have reason to hope we might be able to know a great deal more of these operations of them one upon another, but our minds not being able to discover any connection betwixt these primary qualities of bodies and the sensations that are produced in us by them, we can never be able to establish certain and undoubted rules of the consequence or coexistence of any secondary qualities, though we could discover the size, figure, or motion of those invisible parts which immediately produce them. We are so far from knowing what figure, size, or motion of parts produce a yellow color, a sweet taste, or a sharp sound, that we can by no means conceive how any size, figure, or motion of any particles can possibly produce in us the idea of any color, taste, or sound whatsoever. There is no conceivable connection between the one and the other. 14. And seek in vain for certain and universal knowledge of unperceived qualities in substances. In vain, therefore, shall we endeavor to discover by our ideas the only true way of certain and universal knowledge, what other ideas are to be found constantly joined with that of our complex idea of any substance, since we neither know the real constitution of the minute parts on which their qualities do depend, nor, did we know them, could we discover any necessary connection between them and any of the secondary qualities." which is necessary to be done before we can certainly know their necessary coexistence. So that, let our complex idea of any species of substances be what it will, we can hardly, from the simple ideas contained in it, certainly determine the necessary coexistence of any other quality whatsoever. Our knowledge in all these inquiries reaches very little further than our experience. Indeed, some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another, as figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. But through these, and perhaps some others of our ideas have, yet there are so few of them that have a visible connection one with another, that we can, by intuition or demonstration, discover the coexistence of very few of the qualities that are to be found united in substances, and we are left only to the assistance of our senses to make known to us what qualities they contain. For all of the qualities that are coexistent in any subject, without this dependence and evident connection of their ideas one with another, we cannot know certainly any two to coexist, any further than experience by our senses informs us. 
Thus, though we see the yellow color and upon trial find the weight, malleableness, fusibility, and fixedness that are united in a piece of gold, yet, because no one of these ideas has any evident dependence or necessary connection with the other, we cannot certainly know that where any four of these are, the fifth will be there also, how highly probable soever it may be, because the highest probability amounts not to certainty without which there can be no true knowledge. For this coexistence can be no further known than it is perceived, and it cannot be perceived but either in particular subjects by the observation of our senses or, in general, by the necessary connection of the ideas themselves. 15. Of repugnancy to coexist, our knowledge is larger. As to the incompatibility or repugnancy to coexistence, we may know that any subject may have of each sort of primary qualities but one particular at once, v.g., each particular extension, figure, number of parts, motion excludes all other of each kind. The like also is certain of all sensible ideas peculiar to each sense, for whatever of each kind is present in any subject excludes all other of that sort, v.g., no one subject can have two smells or two colors at the same time. To this, perhaps will be said, has not an opal or the infusion of lignum nephriticum two colors at the same time? To which I answer that these bodies, two eyes differently placed, may at the same time afford different colors. But I take liberty also to say that, two eyes differently placed, it is different parts of the object that reflect the particles of light, and therefore it is not the same part of the object, and so not the very same subject, which at the same time appears both yellow and azure. For it is as impossible that the very same particle of any body should at the same time differently modify or reflect the rays of light, as that it should have two different figures and textures at the same time. 16. Our knowledge of the coexistence of power in bodies extends but a very little way. But as to the powers of substances to change the sensible qualities of other bodies, which make a great part of our inquiries about them, and is no inconsiderable branch of our knowledge, I doubt as to these whether our knowledge reaches much further than our experience, or whether we can come to the discovery of most of these powers, and be certain that they are in any subject by the connection with any of those ideas which to us makes its essence." because the active and passive powers of bodies and their ways of operating consisting in a texture and motion of parts which we cannot by any means come to discover it is but in very few cases we can be able to perceive their dependence on or repugnance to any of those ideas which make our complex one of that sort of things i have here instanced in the corpuscularian hypothesis as that which is thought to go furthest in an intelligible explication of those qualities of bodies and i fear the weakness of human understanding is scarce able to substitute another which will afford us a fuller and clearer discovery of the necessary connection and coexistence of the powers which are to be observed united in several sorts of them this at least is certain that whichever hypothesis be clearest and truest for of that it is not my business to determine, our knowledge concerning corporeal substances will be very little advanced by any of them, till we are made to see what qualities and powers of bodies have a necessary connection or repugnancy one with another, which in the present state of philosophy I think we know but to a very small degree, and I doubt whether, with those faculties we have, we shall ever be able to carry our general knowledge, I say, not particular experience, in this part much further. Experience is that which in this part we must depend on, and it were to be wished that it were more improved. We find the advantages some men's generous pains have this way brought to the stock of natural knowledge, and if others, especially the philosophers by fire who pretend to it, had been so wary in their observations and sincere in their reports as those who call themselves philosophers ought to have been, our acquaintance with the bodies here about us, and our insight into their powers and operations, had been yet much greater. 17. Of the powers that coexist in spirits yet narrower. 
If we are at a loss in respect of the powers and operations of bodies, I think it is easy to conclude we are much more in the dark in reference to spirits, whereof we naturally have no ideas but what we draw from that of our own by reflecting on the operations of our own souls within us as far as they can come within our observation. But how inconsiderable a rank the spirits that inhabit our bodies hold amongst those various and possibly innumerable kinds of nobler beings, and how far short they come of the endowments and perfections of cherubim and seraphim and infinite sorts of spirits above us, is what by a transient hint in another place I have offered to my reader's consideration. 18. Thirdly, of relations between abstracted ideas, it is not easy to say how far our knowledge extends. Thirdly, as to the third sort of our knowledge, viz., the agreement or disagreement of any of our ideas in any other relation. This, as it is the largest field of our knowledge, so it is hard to determine how far it may extend, because the advances that are made in this part of knowledge, depending on our sagacity and in finding intermediate ideas that may show the relations and habitudes of ideas whose coexistence is not considered, it is a hard matter to tell when we are at an end of such discoveries. And when reason has all the helps it is capable of for the finding of proofs or examining the agreement or disagreement of remote ideas, they that are ignorant of algebra cannot imagine the wonders in this kind are to be done by it, and what further improvements and helps advantageous to other parts of knowledge the sagacious mind of man may yet find out, it is not easy to determine. This, at least, I believe, that the ideas of quantity are not those alone that are capable of demonstration and knowledge, and that other, and perhaps more useful parts of contemplation would afford us certainty if vices, passions, and domineering interest did not oppose or menace such endeavors. Morality Capable of Demonstration The idea of a supreme being, infinite in power, goodness, and wisdom, whose workmanship we are and on whom we depend, and the idea of ourselves as understanding, rational creatures, being such as are clear in us would, I suppose, if duly considered and pursued, afford such foundations of our duty and rules of action as might place morality amongst the sciences capable of demonstration, wherein I doubt not but from self-evident propositions by necessary consequences as incontestable as those in mathematics, the measures of right and wrong might be made out to any one that will apply himself with the same indifferency and attention to the one as he does to the other of these sciences. The relation of other modes may certainly be perceived as well as those of number and extension, and I cannot see why they should not also be capable of demonstration if due methods were thought on to examine or pursue their agreement or disagreement. Where there is no property, there is no injustice, is a proposition as certain as any demonstration in Euclid. For the idea of property being a right to anything, and the idea of which the name injustice is given, being the invasion or violation of that right, it is evident that these ideas being thus established, and these names annexed to them, I can as certainly know this proposition to be true as that a triangle has three angles equal to two right ones. Again, no government allows absolute liberty, the idea of government being the establishment of society upon certain rules or laws which require conformity to them, and the idea of absolute liberty being for any one to do whatever he pleases. I am as capable of being certain of the truth of this proposition as of any in the mathematics. 19. Two things have made moral ideas to be thought incapable of demonstration their unfitness for sensible representation, and their complexedness. That which in this respect has given the advantage to the ideas of quantity and made them thought more capable of certainty and demonstration is, first, that they can be set down and represented by sensible marks which have a greater and nearer correspondence with them than any words or sounds whatsoever. Diagrams drawn on paper are copies of the ideas in the mind, and not liable to the uncertainty that words carry in their signification. An angle, circle, or square drawn in lines lies open to the view and cannot be mistaken, 
it remains unchangeable and may at leisure be considered and examined and the demonstration be revised and all the parts of it may be gone over more than once without any danger of the least change in the ideas this cannot be thus done in moral ideas we have no sensible marks that resemble them whereby we can set them down we have nothing but words to express them by which though when written they remain the same yet the ideas they stand for may change in the same man and it is very seldom that they are not different in different persons secondly another thing that makes the greater difficulty in ethics is that moral ideas are commonly more complex than those of the figures ordinarily considered in mathematics from whence these two inconveniences follow first that their names are of more uncertain signification the precise collection of simple ideas they stand for not being so easily agreed on and so the sign that is used for them in communication always and in thinking often does not steadily carry with it the same idea upon which the same disorder confusion and error follow as would if a man going to demonstrate something of an heptagon should in the diagram he took to do it leave out one of the angles or by oversight make the figure with one angle more than the name ordinarily imported or he intended it should when at first he thought of his demonstration this often happens and is hardly avoidable in very complex moral ideas where the same name being retained one angle i e one simple idea is left out or put in the complex one still called by the same name more at one time than another secondly from the complexedness of these moral ideas there follows another inconvenience viz that the mind cannot easily retain those precise combinations so exactly and perfectly as is necessary in the examination of the habitudes and correspondences agreements or disagreements of several of them one with another especially where it is to be judged of by long deductions and the intervention of several other complex ideas to show the agreement or disagreement of two remote ones the great help against this which mathematicians find in diagrams and figures which remain unalterable in their drafts is very apparent and the memory would often have great difficulty otherwise to retain them so exactly whilst the mind went over the parts of them step by step to examine their several correspondences and though in casting up a long sum either in addition multiplication or division every part be only a progression of the mind taking a view of its own ideas and considering their agreement or disagreement and the resolution of the question be nothing but the result of the whole made up of such particulars whereof the mind has a clear perception yet without setting down the several parts by marks whose precise significations are known and by marks that last and remain in view when the memory hath let them go it would be almost impossible to carry so many different ideas in the mind without confounding or letting slip some parts of the reckoning and thereby making all our reasonings about it useless in which case the ciphers or marks help not the mind at all to perceive the agreement of any two or more numbers their equalities or proportions that the mind has only by intuition of its own ideas of the numbers themselves but the numerical characters are helps to the memory to record and retain the several ideas about which the demonstration is made whereby a man may know how far his intuitive knowledge in surveying several of the particulars has proceeded that so he may without confusion go on to what is yet unknown and at last have in one view before him the result of all his perceptions and reasonings twenty remedies of our difficulties in dealing demonstratively with moral ideas one part of these disadvantages and moral ideas which has made them be thought not capable of demonstration may in a good measure be remedied by definitions setting down that collection of simple ideas which every term shall stand for and then using the terms steadily and constantly for that precise collection and what methods algebra or something of that kind may hereafter suggest to remove the other difficulties it is not easy to foretell confident i am that if men would in the same method and with the same indifferency search after moral as they do mathematical truths they would find them have a stronger connection one with another 
and a more necessary consequence from our clear and distinct ideas, and to come nearer perfect demonstration that is commonly imagined. But much of this is not to be expected, whilst the desire of esteem, riches, or power makes men espouse the well-endowed opinions in fashion, and then seek arguments either to make good their beauty, or varnish over and cover their deformity. Nothing being so beautiful to the eye as truth is to the mind, nothing so deformed and irreconcilable to the understanding as a lie. For though many a man can with satisfaction enough own a no very handsome wife in his bosom, yet who is bold enough openly to avow that he has espoused a falsehood and received into his breast so ugly a thing as a lie? Whilst the parties of men cram their tenants down all men's throats whom they can get into their power, without permitting them to examine their truth or falsehood, and will not let truth have fair play in the world, nor men the liberty to search after it. What improvements can be expected of this kind? What greater light can be hoped for in the moral sciences? The subject part of mankind in most places might, instead thereof, with Egyptian bondage, expect Egyptian darkness, were not the candle of the Lord set up by himself in men's minds, which it is impossible for the breath or power of man wholly to extinguish. 21. Fourthly, of the three real existences of which we have certain knowledge. Fourthly, as to know the fourth sort of our knowledge, viz. of the real actual existence of things, we have an intuitive knowledge of our own existence and a demonstrative knowledge of the existence of a god. Of the existence of anything else, we have no other but a sensitive knowledge, which extends not beyond the objects present to our senses. End of section 3《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
What other simple ideas it is possible the creatures in other parts of the universe may have, by the assistance of senses and faculties, more or perfecter than we have, or different from ours, it is not for us to determine. But to say or think there are no such, because we conceive nothing of them, is no better an argument than if a blind man should be positive in it, that there was no such thing as sight and colors, because he had no manner of idea of any such thing, nor could by any means frame to himself any notions about seeing. The ignorance and darkness that is in us no more hinders nor confines the knowledge that is in others, then the blindness of a mole is an argument against the quick-sightedness of an eagle. He that will consider the infinite power, wisdom, and goodness of the Creator of all things will find reason to think it was not all laid out upon so inconsiderable, mean, and impotent a creature as he will find man to be, who in all probability is one of the lowest of all intellectual beings. What faculties, therefore, other species of creatures have to penetrate into the nature and inmost constitutions of things? What ideas they may receive of them far different from ours we know not. This we know and certainly find that we want several other views of them besides those we have, to make discoveries of them more perfect. And we may be convinced that the ideas we can attain to by our faculties are very disproportionate to things themselves, when a positive, clear, distinct one of substance itself, which is the foundation of all the rest, is concealed from us. But want of ideas of this kind, being a part as well as cause of our ignorance, cannot be described. Only this I think I may confidently say of it, that the intellectual and sensible world are in this perfectly alike that that part which we see of either of them holds no proportion with what we see not, and whatsoever we can reach with our eyes or our thoughts of either of them is but a point, almost nothing in comparison of the rest. 24. Want of simple ideas that men are capable of having, but having not, one, because their remoteness, or, secondly, Another great cause of ignorance is the want of ideas we are capable of, as the want of ideas which our faculties are not able to give us shuts us wholly from those views of things which it is reasonable to think other beings, perfecter than we, have of which we know nothing. So the want of ideas I now speak of keeps us in ignorance of things we conceive capable of being known to us. Bulk, figure, and motion we have ideas of, but though we are not without ideas of these primary qualities of bodies in general, yet not knowing what is the particular bulk, figure, and motion of the greatest part of the bodies of the universe, we are ignorant of the several powers, efficacies, and ways of operation whereby the effects which we daily see are produced. These are hid from us in some things by being too remote and in others by being too minute. When we consider the vast distance of the known and visible parts of the world, and the reasons we have to think that what lies within our ken is but a small part of the universe, we shall then discover a huge abyss of ignorance. What are the particular fabrics of the great masses of matter which make up the whole stupendous frame of corporeal beings? How far they are extended, what is their motion, and how continued or communicated, and what influence they have one upon another are contemplations that at first glimpse our thoughts lose themselves in. If we narrow our contemplations and confine our thoughts to this little canton, I mean this system of our sun and the grosser masses of matter that visibly move about it, what several sorts of vegetables, animals, and intellectual corporeal beings infinitely different from those of our little spot of earth may there probably be in the other planets to the knowledge of which even of their outward figures and parts we can no way attain whilst we are confined to this earth there being no natural means either by sensation or reflection to convey their certain ideas into our minds they are out of the reach of those inlets of all our knowledge and what sorts of furniture and inhabitants those mansions contain in them we cannot so much as guess, much less have clear and distinct ideas of them. 25. 2. Because of their minuteness. If a great, nay, far, the greatest part of the several ranks of bodies in the universe escape our notice by their remoteness, 
there are others that are no less concealed from us by their minuteness. These insensible corpuscles, being the active parts of matter and the great instruments of nature, on which depend not only all their secondary qualities, but also most of their natural operations, our want of precise, distinct ideas of their primary qualities keeps us in an incurable ignorance of what we desire to know about them. I doubt not, but if we could discover the figure, size, texture, and motion of the minute constituent parts of any two bodies, we should know, without trial, several of their operations one upon another, as we do now the properties of a square or a triangle. Did we know the mechanical affections of the particles of rhubarb, hemlock, opium, and a man, as a watchmaker does those of a watch, whereby it performs its operations, and of a file, which by rubbing on them will alter the figure of any of the wheels, we should be able to tell beforehand that rhubarb will purge, hemlock, kill, and opium make a man sleep, as well as a watchmaker can that a little piece of paper laid on the balance will keep the watch from going till it be removed, or that, some small part of it being rubbed by a file, the machine would quite lose its motion and the watch go no more. The dissolving of silver in aqua fortis and gold in aqua regia, and not vice versa, would be then perhaps no more difficult to know than it is to a smith to understand why the turning of one key will open a lock and not the turning of another. But whilst we are destitute of senses acute enough to discover the minute particles of bodies and to give us ideas of their mechanical affections, we must be content to be ignorant of their properties and ways of operation. Nor can we be assured about them any further than some few trials we make are able to reach. Whether they will succeed again another time, we cannot be certain. This hinders our certain knowledge of universal truths concerning natural bodies, and our reason carries us herein very little beyond particular matter of fact. 26. Hence, no science of bodies within our reach. And therefore, I am apt to doubt that, how far soever human industry may advance useful and experimental philosophy and physical things, scientifical will still be out of our reach, because we want perfect and adequate ideas of those very bodies which are nearest to us, and most under our command. Those which we have ranked into classes under names, and we think ourselves best acquainted with, we have but very imperfect and incomplete ideas of. Distinct ideas of the several sorts of bodies that fall under the examination of our senses, perhaps we may have, but adequate ideas, I suspect, we have not of any one amongst them. And though the former of these will serve us for common use and discourse, yet whilst we want the latter, we are not capable of scientifical knowledge nor shall ever be able to discover general, instructive, unquestionable truths concerning them. Certainty and demonstration are things we must not in these matters pretend to, by the color, figure, taste, and smell, and other sensible qualities we have as clear and distinct ideas of sage and hemlock as we have of a circle and triangle, but having no ideas of the particular primary qualities of the minute parts of either of these plants, nor of other bodies which we would apply them to, we cannot tell what effects they will produce, nor when we see those effects can we so much as guess, much less know their manner of production. Thus, having no ideas of the particular mechanical affections of the minute parts of bodies that are within our view and reach, we are ignorant of their constitutions, powers, and operations, and of bodies more remote we are yet more ignorant, not knowing so much as their very outward shapes or the sensible and grosser parts of their constitutions. 27. Much less a science of unembodied spirits. This at first will show us how disproportionate our knowledge is to the whole extent, even of material beings, to which, if we add the consideration of that infinite number of spirits that may be, and probably are, which are yet more remote from our knowledge, whereof we have no cognizance, nor can frame to ourselves any distinct ideas of their several ranks and sorts, we shall find this cause of ignorance conceal from us, in an impenetrable obscurity, almost the whole intellectual world, a greater certainty and more beautiful world than the material. 
for baiting some very few and those if i may so call them superficial ideas of spirit which by reflection we get of our own and from thence the best we can collect of the father of all spirits the eternal independent author of them and us and all things we have no certain information so much as of the existence of other spirits but by revelation angels of all sorts are naturally beyond our discovery and all those intelligences whereof it is likely there are more orders than of corporeal substances are things whereof our natural faculties give us no certain account at all that there are minds and thinking beings in other men as well as himself every man has a reason from their words and actions to be satisfied and the knowledge of his own mind cannot suffer a man that considers to be ignorant that there is a god but that there are degrees of spiritual beings between us and the great god who is there that by his own search and ability can come to know much less have we distinct ideas of their different natures conditions states powers and several constitutions wherein they agree or differ from one another and from us and therefore in what concerns their different species and properties we are in absolute ignorance twenty eight secondly another cause want of a discoverable connection between ideas we have secondly what a small part of the substantial beings that are in the universe the want of ideas leaves open to our knowledge we have seen in the next place another cause of ignorance of no less moment is a want of discoverable connection between those ideas we have for wherever we want that we are utterly incapable of universal and certain knowledge and are in the former case left only to observation and experiment which how narrow and confined it is how far from general knowledge we need not be told i shall give some few instances of this cause of our ignorance and so leave it it is evident that the bulk figure and motion of several bodies about us produce in us several sensations as of colors sounds tastes smells pleasure and pain etc these mechanical affections of bodies having no affinity at all with those ideas they produce in us there being no conceivable connection between any impulse of any sort of body and any perception of a color or smell which we find in our minds we can have no distinct knowledge of such operations beyond our experience and can reason no otherwise about them than as effects produced by the appointment of an infinitely wise agent which perfectly surpass our comprehensions as the ideas of sensible secondary qualities which we have in our minds can by us be no way deduced from bodily causes nor any correspondence or connection be found between them and those primary qualities which experience shows us produce them in us so on the other side the operation of our minds upon our bodies is as inconceivable how any thought should produce a motion in body is as remote from the nature of our ideas as how any body should produce any thought in the mind that it is so if experience did not convince us the consideration of the things themselves would never be able in the least to discover to us these and the like though they have a constant and regular connection in the ordinary course of things yet that connection being not discoverable in the ideas themselves which appearing to have no necessary dependence one on another we can attribute their connection to nothing else but the arbitrary determination of that all-wise agent who has made them to be and to operate as they do in a way wholly above our weak understandings to conceive 29 instances in some of our ideas there are certain relations habitudes and connections so visibly included in the nature of the ideas themselves that we cannot conceive them separable from them by any power whatsoever and in these only we are capable of certain and universal knowledge thus the idea of a right line triangle necessarily carries with it an equality of its angles to two right ones nor can we conceive this relation this connection of these two ideas to be possibly mutable or to depend on any arbitrary power which of choice made it thus or could make it otherwise but the coherence and continuity of the parts of matter the production of sensation in us of colors and sounds etc by impulse and motion 
nay, the original rules and communication of motion being such, wherein we can discover no natural connection with any ideas we have, we cannot but ascribe them to the arbitrary will and good pleasure of the wise architect. I need not, I think, here mention the resurrection of the dead, the future state of this globe of earth, and such other things which are by every one acknowledged to depend wholly on the determination of a free agent. The things that, as far as our observation reaches, we constantly find to proceed regularly, we may conclude do act by a law set them, but yet by a law that we know not, whereby, though causes work steadily and effects constantly flow from them, yet their connections and dependencies being not discoverable in our ideas, we can have but an experimental knowledge of them. From all which it is easy to perceive what a darkness we are involved in, how little it is of being, and the things that are, that we are capable to know. And therefore we shall do no injury to our knowledge when we modestly think with ourselves that we are so far from being able to comprehend the whole nature of the universe and all the things contained in it that we are not capable of a philosophical knowledge of the bodies that are about us and make a part of us concerning their secondary qualities, powers, and operations, we can have no universal certainty. Several effects come every day within the notice of our senses, of which we have so far sensitive knowledge, but the causes, manner, and certainty of their production, for the two foregoing reasons, we must be content to be very ignorant of. In these we can go no further than particular experience informs us of matter of fact, and by analogy to guess what effects the like bodies are, upon other trials, like to produce. But as to a perfect science of natural bodies, not to mention spiritual beings, we are, I think, so far from being capable of any such thing, that I conclude it lost labor to seek after it. 30. Thirdly, a third cause, want of tracing our ideas. Thirdly, where we have adequate ideas and where there is a certain and discoverable connection between them, yet we are often ignorant for want of tracing those ideas which we have or may have, and for want of finding out those intermediate ideas which may show us what habitude of agreement or disagreement they have one with another. And thus many are ignorant of mathematical truths, not out of any imperfection of their faculties or uncertainty in the things themselves, but for want of application in acquiring, examining, and by due ways comparing those ideas. That which has most contributed to hinder the due tracing of our ideas in finding out their relations and agreements or disagreements one with another has been, I suppose, the ill use of words. It is impossible that men should ever truly seek or certainly discover the agreement or disagreement of ideas themselves, whilst their thoughts flutter about or stick only in sounds of doubtful and uncertain significations. Mathematicians, abstracting their thoughts from names and accustoming themselves to set before their minds the ideas themselves that they would consider, and not sounds instead of them, have avoided thereby a great part of that perplexity, puttering, and confusion which has so much hindered men's progress in other parts of knowledge. For whilst they stick in words of undetermined and uncertain signification, they are unable to distinguish true from false, certain from probable, consistent from inconsistent in their own opinions. This having been the fate or misfortune of a great part of men of letters, the increase brought into the stock of real knowledge has been very little in proportion to the schools, disputes, and writings the world has been filled with, while students, being lost in the great wood of words, knew not whereabouts they were, how far their discoveries were advanced, or what was wanting in their own or the general stock of knowledge. Had men, in the discoveries of the material, done as they have in those of the intellectual world, involved all in the obscurity of uncertain and doubtful ways of talking, volumes writ of navigation and voyages, theories and stories of zones and tides, multiplied and disputed, nay, ships built and fleets sent out would never have taught us the way beyond the line, and the Antipodes would still be as much unknown as when it was declared heresy to hold there were any. But, having spoken sufficiently of words, and the ill or careless use that is commonly made of them, I shall not say anything more of it here. 
31. Extent of Human Knowledge in Respect to Its Universality Hitherto we have examined the extent of our knowledge in respect of the several sorts of beings that are. There is another extent of it in respect of universality which will also deserve to be considered, and in this regard our knowledge follows the nature of our ideas. If the ideas are abstract, whose agreement or disagreement we perceive, our knowledge is universal. For what is known of such general ideas will be true of every particular thing in whom that essence, i.e. that abstract idea, is to be found, and what is once known of such ideas will be perpetually and forever true, so that as to all general knowledge we must search and find it only in our minds, and it is only the examining of our own ideas that furnisheth us with that. Truths belonging to essences of things, that is, to abstract ideas, are eternal, and are to be found out by the contemplation only of those essences, as the existence of things is to be known only from experience. But having more to say of this in the chapters where I shall speak of general and real knowledge, this may here suffice as to the universality of our knowledge in general. End of section 4「Section 5 of an Essay Concerning Humane Understanding » by John Locke, Book 4 of Knowledge and Probability. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 of The Reality of Knowledge 1. Objection Knowledge placed in our ideas may be all unreal or chimerical i doubt not but my reader by this time may be apt to think that i have been all this while only building a castle in the air and be ready to say to me to what purpose all this stir knowledge say you is only the perception of the agreement or disagreement of our own ideas but who knows what those ideas may be is there anything so extravagant as the imaginations of men's brains where is the head that has no chimeras in it or if there be a sober and a wise man what difference will there be by your rules between his knowledge and that of the most extravagant fancy in the world they both have their ideas and perceive their agreement and disagreement one with another if there be any difference between them the advantage will be on the warm-headed man's side as having the more ideas and the more lively and so by your rules he will be the more knowing if it be true that all knowledge lies only in the perception of the agreement or disagreement of our own ideas the visions of an enthusiast and the reasonings of a sober man will be equally certain it is no matter how things are so a man observe but the agreement of his own imaginations and talk conformably it is all truth all certainty such castles in the air will be as strongholds of truth as the demonstration of euclid that an harpy is not a centaur is by this way a certain knowledge and as much a truth as that a square is not a circle but of what use is all this fine knowledge of men's own imaginations to a man that inquires after the reality of things it matters not what men's fancies are it is the knowledge of things that is only to be prized it is this alone gives a value to our reasonings and preference to one man's knowledge over another's that it is of things as they really are and not of dreams and fancies Two, answer not so where ideas agree with things to which i answer that if our knowledge of ideas terminate in them and reach no further where there is something further intended our most serious thoughts will be of little more use than the reveries of a crazy brain and the truths built thereon of no more weight than the discourses of a man who sees things clearly in a dream and with great assurance utters them but i hope before i have done to make it evident that this way of certainty by the knowledge of our own ideas goes a little further than bare imagination 
and i believe it will appear that all the certainty of general truths a man has lies in nothing else three but what shall be the criterion of this agreement it is evident the mind knows not things immediately but only by the intervention of the ideas it has of them our knowledge therefore is real only so far as there is a conformity between our ideas and the reality of things but what shall be here the criterion how shall the mind when it perceives nothing but its own ideas know that they agree with things themselves this though it seems not to want difficulty yet i think there be two sorts of ideas that we may be assured agree with things for as first all simple ideas are really conformed to things first the first are simple ideas which since the mind as has been showed can by no means make to itself must necessarily be the product of things operating on the mind in a natural way and producing therein those perceptions which by the wisdom and will of our maker they are ordained and adapted to from whence it follows that simple ideas are not fictions of our fancies but the natural and regular productions of things without us really operating upon us and so carry with them all the conformity which is intended or which our state requires for they represent to us things under those appearances which they are fitted to produce in us whereby we are enabled to distinguish the sorts of particular substances to discern the states they are in and so to take them for our necessities and apply them to our uses thus the idea of whiteness or bitterness as it is in the mind exactly answering that power which is in any body to produce it there has all the real conformity it can or ought to have with things without us and this conformity between our simple ideas and the existence of things is sufficient for real knowledge five secondly all complex ideas except ideas of substances are their own archetypes secondly all our complex ideas except those of substances being archetypes of the mind's own making not intended to be the copies of anything nor referred to the existence of anything as to their originals cannot want any conformity necessary to real knowledge for that which is not designed to represent anything but itself can never be capable of a wrong representation nor mislead us from the true apprehension of anything by its dislikeness to it and such excepting those of substances are all our complex ideas which as i have showed in another place are combinations of ideas which the mind by its free choice puts together without considering any connection they have in nature and hence it is that in all these sorts the ideas themselves are considered as the archetypes and things no otherwise regarded but as they are conformable to them so that we cannot but be infallibly certain that all the knowledge we attain concerning these ideas is real and reaches things themselves because in all our thoughts reasonings and discourses of this kind we intend things no further than as they are conformable to our ideas so that in these we cannot miss of a certain and undoubted reality six hence the reality of mathematical knowledge i doubt not but it will be easily granted that the knowledge we have of mathematical truths is not only certain but real knowledge and not the bare empty vision of vain insignificant chimeras of the brain and yet if we will consider we shall find that it is only of our own ideas the mathematician considers the truth and properties belonging to a rectangle or circle only as they are in idea in his own mind for it is possible he never found either of them existing mathematically for instance precisely true in his life but yet the knowledge he has of any truths or properties belonging to a circle or any mathematical figure are nevertheless true and certain even of real things existing 
because real things are no further concerned nor intended to be meant by any such propositions than as things really agree to those archetypes in his true mind is it true of the idea of a triangle that its three angles are equal to two bright ones it is true also of a triangle wherever it really exists whatever other figure exists that it is not exactly answerable to that idea of a triangle in his mind is not at all concerned in that proposition and therefore he is certain all his knowledge concerning such ideas is real knowledge because intending things no further than they agree with those his ideas he is sure what he knows concerning those figures when they are barely an ideal existence in his mind will hold true of them also when they have a real existence in matter his consideration being barely of those figures which are the same wherever or however they exist seven and of moral and hence it follows that moral knowledge is as capable of real certainty as mathematics for certainty being but the perception of the agreement or disagreement of our ideas and demonstration nothing but the perception of such agreement by the intervention of other ideas or mediums our moral ideas as well as mathematical being archetypes themselves and so adequate and complete ideas all the agreement or disagreement which we shall find in them will produce real knowledge as well as in mathematical figures eight existence not required to make abstract knowledge real for the attaining of knowledge and certainty it is requisite that we have determined ideas and to make our knowledge real it is requisite that the ideas answer their archetypes nor let it be wondered that i place the certainty of our knowledge in the consideration of our ideas with so little care and regard as it may seem to the real existence of things since most of those discourses which take up the thoughts and engage the disputes of those who pretend to make it their business to inquire after truth and certainty will i presume upon examination be found to be general propositions and notions in which existence is not at all concerned all the discourses of the mathematicians about the squaring of a circle conic sections or any other part of mathematics concern not the existence of any of those figures but their demonstrations which depend on their ideas are the same whether there be any square or circle existing in the world or no in the same manner the truth and certainty of moral discourses abstracts from the lives of men and the existence of those virtues in the world whereof they treat nor are tully's offices less true because there is nobody in the world that exactly practises his rules and lives up to that pattern of a virtuous man which he has given us and which existed nowhere when he writ but in idea if it be true in speculation for instance in idea that murder deserves death it will also be true in reality of any action that exists conformable to that idea of murder as for other actions the truth of that proposition concerns them not and thus it is of all other species of things which have no other essences but those ideas which are in the minds of men nine nor will it be less true or certain because moral ideas are of our own making and naming but it will here be said that if moral knowledge be placed in the contemplation of our own moral ideas and those as other modes be of our own making what strange notions will there be of justice and temperance what confusion of virtues and vices if every one may make what ideas of them he pleases no confusion or disorder in the things themselves nor the reasonings about them no more than in mathematics there would be a disturbance in the demonstration or a change in the properties of figures and their relations one to another if a man should make a triangle with four corners or a trapezium with four right angles that is in plain english 
change the names of the figures and call that by one name which mathematicians call ordinarily by another for let a man make to himself the idea of a figure with three angles whereof one is a right one and call it if he please equilaterum or trapezium or anything else the properties of and demonstrations about that idea will be the same as if he called it a rectangular triangle i confess the change of the name by the impropriety of speech will at first disturb him who knows not what idea it stands for but as soon as the figure is drawn the consequences and demonstration are plain and clear just the same is it in moral knowledge let a man have the idea of taking from others without their consent what their honest industry has possessed them of and call this justice if he please he that takes the name here without the idea put to it will be mistaken by joining another idea of his own to that name but strip the idea of that name or take it such as it is in the speaker's mind and the same things will agree to it as if you called it injustice indeed wrong names in moral discourses breed usually more disorder because they are not so easily rectified as in mathematics where the figure once drawn and seen makes the name useless and of no force for what need of a sign when the thing signified is present and in view but in moral names that cannot be so easily and shortly done because of the many decompositions that go to the making up the complex ideas of those modes but yet for all this the miscalling of any of those ideas contrary to the usual signification of the words of that language hinders not but that we may have certain and demonstrative knowledge of their several agreements and disagreements if we will carefully as in mathematics keep to the same precise ideas and trace them in their several relations one to another without being led away by their names if we but separate the idea under consideration from the sign that stands for it our knowledge goes equally on in the discovery of real truth and certainty whatever sounds we make use of ten misnaming disturbs not the certainty of the knowledge one thing more we are to take notice of that where god or any other lawmaker hath defined any moral names there they have made the essence of that species to which that name belongs and there it is not safe to apply or use them otherwise but in other cases it is bare impropriety of speech to apply them contrary to the common usage of the country but yet even this too disturbs not the certainty of that knowledge which is still to be had by a due contemplation and comparing of those even nicknamed ideas eleven thirdly our complex ideas of substances have their archetypes without us and here knowledge comes short thirdly there is another sort of complex ideas which being referred to archetypes without us may differ from them and so our knowledge about them may come short of being real such are our ideas of substances which consisting of a collection of simple ideas supposed taken from the works of nature may yet vary from them by having more or different ideas united in them than are to be found united in the things themselves from whence it comes to pass that they may and often do fail of being exactly conformable to things themselves twelve so far as our complex ideas agree with those archetypes without us so far our knowledge concerning substances is real i say then that to have ideas of substances which by being conformable to things may afford us real knowledge it is not enough as in modes to put together such ideas as have no inconsistence though they did never before so exist for instance the ideas of sacrilege or perjury etc were as real and true ideas before as after the existence of any such fact but our ideas of substances being supposed copies 
and referred to archetypes without us must still be taken from something that does or has existed they must not consist of ideas put together at the pleasure of our thoughts without any real pattern they were taken from though we can perceive no inconsistence in such a combination the reason whereof is because we knowing not what real constitution it is of substances whereon our simple ideas depend and which really is the cause of the strict union of some of them one with another and the exclusion of others there are very few of them that we can be sure are or are not inconsistent in nature any further than experience and sensible observation reach herein therefore is founded the reality of our knowledge concerning substances that all our complex ideas of them must be such and such only as are made up of such simple ones as have been discovered to coexist in nature and our ideas being thus true though not perhaps very exact copies are yet the subjects of real as far as we have any knowledge of them which as has been already shown will not be found to reach very far but so far as it does it will still be real knowledge whatever ideas we have the agreement we find they have with others will still be knowledge if those ideas be abstract it will be general knowledge but to make it real concerning substances the ideas must be taken from the real existence of things whatever simple ideas have been found to coexist in any substance these we may with confidence join together again and so make abstract ideas of substances for whatever have once had an union in nature may be united again thirteen in our inquiries about substances we must consider ideas and not confine our thoughts to names or species supposed set out by names this if we rightly consider and confine not our thoughts and abstract ideas to names as if they were or could be no other sorts of things than what known names had already determined and as it were set out we should think of things with greater freedom and less confusion than perhaps we do it would possibly be thought a bold paradox if not a very dangerous falsehood if i should say that some changelings who have lived forty years together without any appearance of reason are something between a man and a beast which prejudice is found upon nothing else but a false supposition that these two names man and beast stand for distinct species so set out by real essences that there can come no other species between them whereas if we will abstract from those names and the supposition of such specific essences made by nature wherein all things of the same denominations did exactly and equally partake if we would not fancy that there were a certain number of these essences wherein all things as in moulds were cast and formed we should find that the idea of the shape motion and life of a man without reason in as much a distinct idea and makes as much a distinct sort of things from man and beast as the idea of the shape of an ass with reason would be different from either that of man or beast and be a species of an animal between or distinct from both fourteen objection against a changeling being something between a man and beast answered here everybody will be ready to ask if changelings may be supposed something between man and beast pray what are they i answer changelings which is as good a word to signify something different from the signification of man or beast as the names man and beast are to have significations different one from the other this well considered would resolve this matter and show by meaning without any more ado but i am not so unacquainted with the zeal of some men which enables them to spin consequences and to see religion threatened whenever any one ventures to quit their forms of speaking as not to foresee what names such a proposition as this is like to be charged with and without doubt it will be asked if changelings are something between man and beast 
what will become of them in the other world to which i answer i it concerns me not to know or inquire to their own master they stand or fall it will make their state neither better nor worse whether we determine anything of it or no they are in the hands of a faithful creator and a bountiful father who disposes not of his creatures according to our narrow thoughts or opinions nor distinguishes them according to names and species of our contrivance and we that know so little of this present world we are in may i think content ourselves without being peremptory in defining the different states which creatures shall come into when they go off this stage it may suffice us that he hath made known to all those who are capable of instruction discoursing and reasoning that they shall come to an account and receive according to what they have done in this body fifteen what will become of changelings in a future state but secondly i answer the force of these men's question namely will you deprive changelings of a future state is founded on one of these two suppositions which are both false the first is that all things that have the outward shape and appearance of a man must necessarily be designed to an immortal future being after this life or secondly that whatever is of human birth must be so take away these imaginations and such questions will be groundless and ridiculous i desire then those who think there is no more but an accidental difference between themselves and changelings the essence in both being exactly the same to consider whether they can imagine immortality annexed to any outward shape of the body the very proposing it is i suppose enough to make them disown it no one yet that ever i heard of how much soever immersed in matter allowed that excellency to any figure of the gross sensible outward consequence of it or that any mass of matter should after its dissolution here be again restored hereafter to an everlasting state of sense perception and knowledge only because it was moulded into this or that figure and had such a particular frame of its visible parts such an opinion as this placing immortality in a certain superficial figure turns out of doors all consideration of soul or spirit upon whose account alone some corporal beings have hitherto been concluded immortal and others not this is to attribute more to the outside than inside of things and to place the excellency of a man more in the external shape of his body than internal perfections of his soul which is but little better than to annex the great and inestimable advantage of immortality and life everlasting which he has above other material beings to annex it i say to the cut of his beard or the fashion of his coat for this or that outward mark of our bodies no more carries with it the hope of an eternal duration than the fashion of a man's suit gives him reasonable grounds to imagine it will never wear out or that it will make him immortal it will perhaps be said that nobody thinks that the shape makes anything immortal but it is the shape that is the sign of a rational soul within which is immortal i wonder who made it the sign of any such thing for barely saying it will not make it so it would require some proofs to persuade one of it no figure that i know speaks any such language for it may as rationally be concluded that the dead body of a man wherein there is to be found no more appearance or action of life than there is in a statue has yet nevertheless a living soul in it because of its shape as that there is a rational soul in a changeling because he has the outside of a rational creature when his actions carry far less marks of reason with them in the whole course of his life than what are to be found in many a beast sixteen monsters but it is the issue of rational parents and must therefore be concluded to have a rational soul i know not by what logic you must so conclude i am sure this is a conclusion that men nowhere allow of for if they did 
they would not make bold as everywhere they do to destroy ill-formed and misshaped productions ay but these are monsters let them be so what will your drivelling unintelligent intractable changeling be shall a defect in the body make a monster a defect in the mind the far more noble and in the common phrase the far more essential part not shall the want of a nose or a neck make a monster and put such issue out of the rank of men the want of reason and understanding not this is to bring all back again to what was exploded just now this is to place all in the shape and to take the measure of a man only by his outside to show that according to the ordinary way of reasoning in this matter people do lay the whole stress on the figure and resolve the whole essence of the species of man as they make it into the outward shape how unreasonable soever it be and how much soever they disown it we need but trace their thoughts and practice a little further and then it will plainly appear the well-shaped changeling is a man has a rational soul though it appear not this is past doubt say you make the ears a little longer and more pointed and the nose a little flatter than ordinary and then you begin to boggle make the face yet narrower flatter and longer and then you are at a stand add still more and more of the likeness of a brute to it and let the head be perfectly that of some other animal then presently it is a monster and it is demonstration with you that it hath no rational soul and must be destroyed where now i ask shall be the just measure which the utmost bounds of that shape that carries with it a rational soul for since there have been human fetuses produced half beast and half man and others three parts one and one part the other and so it is possible they may be in all the variety of approaches to the one or the other shape and may have several degrees of mixture of the likeness of a man or a brute i would gladly know what are those precise lineaments which according to this hypothesis are or are not capable of a rational soul to be joined to them what sort of outside is the certain sign that there is or is not such an inhabitant within for till that be done we talk at random of man and shall always i fear to do so as long as we give ourselves up to certain sounds and the imaginations of settled and fixed species in nature we know not what but after all i desire it may be considered that those who think they have answered the difficulty by telling us that a misshaped fetus is a monster run into the same fault they are arguing against by constituting a species between man and beast for what else i pray is there monster in the case if the word monster signifies anything at all but something neither man nor beast but partaking somewhat of either and just so is the changeling before mentioned so necessary is it to quit the common notion of species and essences if we will truly look into the nature of things and examine them by what our faculties can discover in them as they exist and not by groundless fancies that have been taken up about them seventeen words and species i have mentioned this here because i think we cannot be too cautious that words and species in the ordinary notions which we have been used to of them impose not on us for i am apt to think therein lies one great obstacle to our clear and distinct knowledge especially in reference to substances and from thence has rose a great part of the difficulties about truth and certainty would we accustom ourselves to separate our contemplations and reasonings from words we might in a great measure remedy this inconvenience within our own thoughts but yet it would still disturb us in our discourse with others as long as we retained the opinion 
that species and their essences were anything else but our abstract ideas such as they are with names annexed to them to be the signs of them eighteen recapitulation wherever we perceive the agreement or disagreement of any of our ideas there is certain knowledge and wherever we are sure those ideas agree with the reality of things there is certain real knowledge of which agreement of our ideas with the reality of things having here given the marks i think i have shown wherein it is that certainty real certainty consists which whatever it was to others was i confess to me heretofore one of those desiderata which i found great want of end of section five section six of an essay concerning humane understanding by john locke book four of knowledge and probability this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter five of truth in general one what truth is what is truth was an inquiry many ages since and it being that which all mankind either do or pretend to search after it cannot but be worth our while carefully to examine wherein it consists and so acquainting ourselves with the nature of it as to observe how the mind distinguishes it from falsehood two a right joining or separating of signs i e either ideas or words truth then seems to me in the proper import of the word to signify nothing but the joining or separating of signs as the things signified by them do agree or disagree one with another the joining or separating of signs here meant is what by another name we call proposition so that truth properly belongs only to propositions whereof there are two sorts viz mental and verbal as there are two sorts of signs commonly made use of viz ideas and words three which make mental or verbal propositions to form a clear notion of truth it is very necessary to consider truth of thought and truth of words distinctly one from another but yet it is very difficult to treat of them asunder because it is unavoidable in treating of mental propositions to make use of words and then the instances given of mental propositions cease immediately to be barely mental and become verbal for a mental proposition being nothing but a bare consideration of the ideas as they are in our minds stripped of names they lose the nature of purely mental propositions as soon as they are put into words four mental propositions are very hard to be treated of and that which makes it yet harder to treat of mental and verbal propositions separately is that most men if not all in their thinking and reasonings within themselves make use of words instead of ideas at least when the subject of their meditation contains in it complex ideas which is a great evidence of the imperfection and uncertainty of our ideas of that kind and may if attentively made use of serve for a mark to show us what are those things we have clear and perfect established ideas of and what not for if we will curiously observe the way our mind takes in thinking and reasoning we shall find i suppose that when we make any propositions within our own thoughts about white or black sweet or bitter a triangle or a circle we can and often do frame in our minds the ideas themselves without reflecting on the names but when we would consider or make propositions about the more complex ideas as of a man vitriol fortitude glory we usually put the name for the idea because the ideas these names stand for 
being for the most part imperfect, confused, and undetermined, we reflect on the names themselves, because they are more clear, certain, and distinct, and readier occur to our thoughts than the pure ideas. And so we make use of these words instead of the ideas themselves, even when we would meditate and reason within ourselves, and make tacit mental propositions. In substances, as has been already noticed, this is occasioned by the imperfections of our ideas, we making the name stand for the real essence, of which we have no idea at all. In modes, it is occasioned by the great number of simple ideas that go to the making them up. For many of them being compounded, the name occurs much easier than the complex idea itself, which requires time and attention to be recollected, and exactly represented to the mind, even in those men who have formerly been at the pains to do it, and is utterly impossible to be done by those who, though they have ready in their memory the greatest part of the common words of that language, yet perhaps never troubled themselves in all their lives to consider what precise ideas the most of them stood for. Some confused or obscure notions have served their turns, and many who talk very much of religion and conscience, of church and faith, of power and right, of obstructions and humours, melancholy and choler, would perhaps have little left in their thoughts and meditations, if one should desire them to think only of the things themselves, and lay by those words with which they so often confound others, and not seldom themselves also. 5. Mental and verbal propositions contrasted. But to return to the consideration of truth, we must, I say, observe two sorts of propositions that we are capable of making. First, mental, wherein the ideas in our understandings are without the use of words put together, or separated, by the mind perceiving or judging of their agreement or disagreement. Secondly, verbal propositions, which are words, the signs of our ideas, put together or separated in affirmative or negative sentences. By which way of affirming or denying, these signs, made by sounds, are, as it were, put together or separated from another so that proposition consists in joining or separating signs, and truth consists in the putting together or separating those signs, according as the things which they stand for agree or disagree. 6. When mental propositions contain real truth, and when verbal. Everyone's experience will satisfy him that the mind, either by perceiving or supposing, the agreement or disagreement of any of its ideas, does tacitly within itself put them into a kind of proposition, affirmative or negative, which I have endeavoured to express by the terms putting together and separating. But this action of the mind, which is so familiar to every thinking and reasoning man, is easier to be conceived by reflecting on what passes in us when we affirm or deny than to be explained by words. When a man has in his head the idea of two lines, viz., the side and diagonal of a square, whereof the diagonal is an inch long, he may have the idea also of the division of that line into a certain number of equal parts, v.g., into five, ten, a hundred, a thousand, or any other number, and may have the idea of that inch line being divisible, or not divisible, into such equal parts, as a certain number of them will be equal to the side-line. Now, whenever he perceives, believes, or supposes such a kind of divisibility to agree or disagree to his idea of that line, he, as it were, joins or separates those two ideas, viz., the idea of that line and the idea of that kind of divisibility, and so makes a mental proposition, which is true or false, according as such a kind of divisibility, a divisibility into such aliquot parts, does really agree to that line or no. When ideas are so put together, or separated in the mind, as they or the things they stand for do agree or not, that is, as I may call it, mental truth, 
but truth of words is something more and that is the affirming or denying of words one of another as the ideas they stand for agree or disagree and this again is twofold either purely verbal and trifling which i shall speak of chapter eight or real and instructive which is the object of that real knowledge which we have spoken of already seven objection against verbal truth that thus it may all be chimerical but here again will be apt to occur the same doubt about truth that it did about knowledge and it will be objected that if truth be nothing but the joining and separating of words and propositions as the ideas they stand for agree or disagree in men's minds the knowledge of truth is not so valuable a thing as it is taken to be nor worth the pains and time men employ in the search of it since by this account it amounts to no more than the conformity of words to the chimeras of men's brains who knows not what odd notions many men's heads are filled with and what strange ideas all men's brains are capable of but if we rest here we know the truth of nothing by this rule but of the visionary words in our own imaginations nor have other truths but what as much concerns harpies and centaurs as men and horses for those and the like may be ideas in our heads and have their agreement or disagreement there as well as the ideas of real beings and so have as true propositions made about them and it will be altogether as true a proposition to say all centaurs are animals as that all men are animals and the certainty of one as great as the other for in both the propositions the words are put together according to the agreement of the ideas in our minds and the agreement of the idea of animal with that of centaur is as clear and visible to the mind as the agreement of the idea of animal with that of man and so these two propositions are equally true equally certain but of what use is all such truth to us eight answered real truth is about ideas agreeing to things though what has been said in the foregoing chapter to distinguish real from imaginary knowledge might suffice here in answer to this doubt to distinguish real truth from chimerical or if you please barely nominal they depending both on the same foundation yet it may not be amiss here again to consider that though our words signify things the truth they contain when put into propositions will be only verbal when they stand for ideas in the mind that have not an agreement with the reality of things and therefore truth as well as knowledge may well come under the distinction of verbal and real that being only verbal truth wherein terms are joined according to the agreement or disagreement of the ideas they stand for without regarding whether our ideas are such as really have or are capable of having an existence in nature but then it is they contain real truths when these signs are joined as our ideas agree and when our ideas are such as we know are capable of having an existence in nature which in substances we cannot know but by knowing that such have existed nine truth and falsehood in general truth is the marking down in words the agreement or disagreement of ideas as it is falsehood is the marking down in words the agreement or disagreement of ideas otherwise than it is and so far as these ideas thus marked by sounds agree to their archetypes so far only is the truth real the knowledge of this truth consists in knowing what ideas the words stand for and the perception of the agreement or disagreement of those ideas according as it is marked by those words ten general propositions to be treated of more at large but because words are looked on as the great conduits of truth and knowledge and that in conveying and receiving of truth and commonly in reasoning about it we make use of words and propositions i shall more at large inquire wherein the certainty of real truth 
contained in propositions consists, and where it is to be had, and endeavor to show in what sort of universal propositions we are capable of being certain of their real truth or falsehood. I shall begin with general propositions, as those which most employ our thoughts and exercise our contemplation. General truths are most looked after by the mind, as those that most enlarge our knowledge, and by their comprehensiveness, satisfying us at once, of many particulars, enlarge our view, and shorten our way to knowledge. 11. Moral and Metaphysical Truth Besides truth taken in a strict sense before mentioned, there are other sorts of truth, as 1. Moral truth, which is speaking of things according to the persuasion of our own minds, though the proposition we speak agree not to the reality of things. 2. Metaphysical truth, which is nothing but the real existence of things, conformable to the ideas to which we have annexed their names. This, though it seems to consist in the very beings of things, yet, when considered a little nearly, will appear to include a tacit proposition, whereby the mind joins that particular thing to the idea it had before settled with the name to it. But these considerations of truth, either having been before taken notice of, or not being much to our present purpose, it may suffice here only to have mentioned them. End of section 6「Section 7 of An Essay Concerning Human Understanding by John Locke, Book 4, of Knowledge and Probability. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Henry. Chapter 6 Of Universal Propositions, Their Truth and Certainty. 1. Treating of Words Necessary to Knowledge Though the examining and judging of ideas by themselves, their names being quite laid aside, be the best and surest way to clear and distinct knowledge, yet, through the prevailing custom of using sounds for ideas, I think it is very seldom practiced. Every one may observe how common it is for names to be made use of instead of the ideas themselves. Even when men think and reason within their own breasts, especially if the ideas be very complex and made up of a great collection of simple ones. This makes the consideration of words and propositions so necessary a part of the treatise of knowledge that it is very hard to speak intelligibly of the one without explaining the other. 2. General truths hardly to be understood but in verbal propositions. All the knowledge we have, being only of particular or general truths, it is evident that whatever may be done in the former of these, the latter, which is that which with reason is most sought after, can never be well made known and is very seldom apprehended, but as conceived and expressed in words. It is not, therefore, out of our way in the examination of our knowledge to inquire into the truth and certainty of universal propositions. 3. Certainty twofold of truth and of knowledge. But that we may not be misled in this case by that which is the danger everywhere, I mean, by the doubtfulness of terms, it is fit to observe that certainty is twofold, certainty of truth and certainty of knowledge. Certainty of truth is 
when words are so put together in propositions as exactly to express the agreement or disagreement of the ideas they stand for, as really it is. Certainty of knowledge is to perceive the agreement or disagreement of ideas as expressed in any proposition. This we usually call knowing or being certain of the truth of any proposition. 4. No proposition can be certainly known to be true where the real essence of each species mentioned is not known. Now, because we cannot be certain of the truth of any general proposition unless we know the precise bounds and extent of the species its terms stand for, it is necessary we should know the essence of each species, which is that which constitutes and bounds it. This, in all simple ideas and modes, is not hard to do, for in these, the real and nominal essence being the same, or which is all one, the abstract idea which the general term stands for being the sole essence and boundary that is or can be supposed of the species, there can be no doubt how far the species extends or what things are comprehended under each term, which, it is evident, are all that have an exact conformity with the idea it stands for and no other. But in substances wherein a real essence distinct from the nominal is supposed to constitute, determine, and bound the species, the extent of the general word is very uncertain, because not knowing this real essence, we cannot know what is or what is not of that species, and consequently what may or may not with certainty be affirmed of it. And thus, speaking of a man, or gold, or any other species of natural substances, as supposed constituted by a precise and real essence which nature regularly imparts to every individual of that kind, whereby it is made to be of that species, we cannot be certain of the truth of any affirmation or negation made of it. For man, or gold, taken in this sense and used for species of things constituted by real essences different from the complex idea in the mind of the speaker, stand for we know not what. And the extent of these species, with such boundaries, are so unknown and undetermined that it is impossible with any certainty to affirm that all men are rational, or that all gold is yellow. But where the nominal essence is kept to as the boundary of each species, and men extend the application of any general term no further than to the particular things in which the complex idea it stands for is to be found, there they are in no danger to mistake the bounds of each species, nor can be in doubt, on this account, whether any proposition be true or not. I have chosen to explain this uncertainty of propositions in this scholastic way, and have made use of the terms of essences and species on purpose, to show the absurdity and inconvenience there is to think of them as of any other sort of realities than barely abstract ideas with names to them. To suppose that the species of things are anything but the sorting of them under general names, according as they agree to several abstract ideas of which we make those names signs, is to confound truth and introduce uncertainty into all general propositions that can be made about them. Though, therefore, these things might, to people not possessed with scholastic learning, be treated of in a better and clearer way 
Yet those wrong notions of essences or species having got root in most people's minds who have received any tincture from the learning which has prevailed in this part of the world are to be discovered and removed to make way for that use of words which should convey certainty with it. 5. This more particularly concerns substances. The names of substances, then, whenever made to stand for species which are supposed to be constituted by real essences which we know not, are not capable to convey certainty to the understanding. Of the truth, general propositions made up of such terms we cannot be sure. The reason whereof is plain, for how can we be sure that this or that quality is in gold when we know not what is or is not gold? Since in this way of speaking, nothing is gold but what partakes of an essence which we, not knowing, cannot know where it is or is not. And so cannot be sure that any parcel of matter in the world is or is is not in this sense gold, being incurably ignorant whether it has or has not that which makes anything to be called gold, i.e., that real essence of gold, whereof we have no idea at all, this being as impossible for us to know as it is for a blind man to tell in what flower the color of a pansy is or is not to be found, whilst he has no idea of the color of a pansy at all. Or, if we could, which is impossible, certainly know where a real essence, which we know not, is, v.g., in what parcels of matter the real essence of gold is, yet could we not be sure that this or that quality could with truth be affirmed of gold? Since it is impossible for us to know that this or that quality or idea has a necessary connection with a real essence of which we have no idea at all whatever species that supposed real essence may be imagined to constitute. 6. On the other side, the names of substances, when made use of as they should be, for the ideas men have in their minds, though they carry a clear and determinate signification with them, will not yet serve us to make many universal propositions of whose truth we can be certain. Not because in this use of them we are uncertain what things are signified by them, but because the complex ideas they stand for are such combinations of simple ones as carry not with them any discoverable connection or repugnancy, but with a very few other ideas. 7. The complex ideas that our names of the species of substances properly stand for are collections of such qualities as have been observed to coexist in an unknown substratum, which we call substance. But what other qualities necessarily coexist with such combinations, we cannot certainly know unless we can discover their natural dependence, which, in their primary qualities, we can go but a very little way in, and in all their secondary qualities we can discover no connection at all. For the reasons mentioned, chapter 3, viz. 1. Because we know not the real constitutions of substances on which each secondary quality particularly depends. 2. Did we know that, it would serve us only for experimental, not universal knowledge and reach with certainty no further than that bare instance, because our understandings can discover 
no conceivable connection between any secondary quality and any modification whatsoever of any of the primary ones. And therefore, there are very few general propositions to be made concerning substances which can carry with them undoubted certainty. 8. Instance in gold. All gold is fixed, is a proposition whose truth we cannot be certain of, how universally soever it be believed. For if, according to the useless imagination of the schools, anyone supposes the term gold to stand for a species of things set out by nature, by a real essence belonging to it, it is evident he knows not what particular substances are of that species, and so cannot with certainty affirm anything universally of gold. But if he makes gold stand for a species determined by its nominal essence, let the nominal essence, for example, be the complex idea of a body of a certain yellow color, malleable, fusible, and heavier than any other known, in this proper use of the word gold, there is no difficulty to know what is or is not gold. But yet no other quality can with certainty be universally affirmed or denied of gold but what hath a discoverable connection or inconsistency with that nominal essence. Fixedness, for example, having no necessary connection that we can discover with the color, weight, or any other simple idea of our complex one, or with the whole combination together, it is impossible that we should certainly know the truth of this proposition, that all gold is fixed. 9. No discoverable necessary connection between nominal essence gold and other simple ideas. As there is no discoverable connection between fixedness and the color, weight, and other simple ideas of that nominal essence of gold, so if we make our complex idea of gold a body, yellow, fusible, ductile, weighty, and fixed, we shall be at the same uncertainty concerning solubility in aqua regia, and for the same reason, since we can never, from consideration of the ideas themselves, with certainty affirm or deny of a body whose complex idea is made up of yellow, very weighty, ductile, fusible, and fixed, that it is soluble in aqua regia, and so on of the rest of its qualities, I would gladly meet with one general affirmation concerning any will no doubt be presently objected. Is not this an universal proposition? All gold is malleable? To which I answer, it is a very complex idea the word gold stands for. But then here is nothing affirmed of gold but that that sound stands for an idea in which malleableness is contained, and such a sort of truth and certainty as this it is to say a centaur is four-footed. But if malleableness make not a part of the specific essence the name of gold stands for, it is plain all gold is malleable, is not a certain proposition, because let the complex idea of gold be made up of whichsoever of its other qualities you please, malleableness will not appear to depend on that complex idea, nor follow from any simple one contained in it. The connection that malleableness has, if it has any, with those other qualities being only by the intervention of the real constitution of its insensible parts, which, since we know not, it is impossible we should perceive that connection 
unless we could discover that which ties them together. 10. As far as any such coexistence can be known, so far universal propositions may be certain, but this will go but a little way. The more, indeed, of these coexisting qualities we unite into one complex idea under one name, the more precise and determinate we make the signification of that word, but never yet make it thereby more capable of universal certainty in respect of other qualities not contained in our complex idea, since we perceive not their connection or dependence on one another, being ignorant both of that real constitution in which they are all founded and also how they flow from it. For the chief part of our knowledge concerning substances is not, as in other things, barely of the relation of two ideas that may exist separately, but is of the necessary connection and coexistence of several distinct ideas in the same subject, or of their repugnancy so to coexist. Could we begin at the other end and discover what it was wherein that color consisted, what made a body lighter or heavier, what texture of parts made it malleable, fusible, and fixed, and fit to be dissolved in this sort of liquor, and not another, if, I say, we had such an idea as this of bodies, we could perceive wherein all sensible qualities originally consist, and how they are produced, we might frame such abstract ideas of them as would furnish us with matter of more general knowledge, and enable us to make universal propositions that should carry general truth and certainty with them. But whilst our complex ideas of the sorts of substances are so remote from that internal real constitution on which their sensible qualities depend and are made up of nothing but an imperfect collection of those apparent qualities our senses can discover, there can be few general propositions concerning substances of whose real truth we can be certainly assured, since there are but few simple ideas of whose connection and necessary coexistence we can have certain and undoubted knowledge. I imagine, amongst all the secondary qualities of substances, and the powers relating to them, there cannot any two be named whose necessary coexistence or repugnance to coexist, can certainly be known, unless in those of the same sense, which necessarily exclude one another, as I have elsewhere showed. No one, I think, by the color that is in any body, can certainly know what smell, taste, sound, or tangible qualities it has, nor what alterations it is capable to make or receive on or from other bodies. The same may be said of the sound or taste, etc. Our specific names of substances standing for any collections of such ideas, it is not to be wondered that we can with them make very few general propositions of undoubted real certainty. But yet, so far as any complex idea of any sort of substances contains in it any simple idea whose necessary coexistence with any other may be discovered, so far universal propositions may with certainty be made concerning it. V.G., could anyone discover a necessary connection between malleableness and the color or weight of gold, or any other part of the complex idea signified by that name, he might make a certain universal proposition concerning gold in this respect. And the real truth of this proposition, that all gold is malleable, would be as certain as of this, 
the three angles of all right lined triangles are all equal to two right ones. 11. The qualities which make our complex ideas of substances depend mostly on external, remote, and unperceived causes. Had we such ideas of substances as to know what real constitutions produce those sensible qualities we find in them, and how those qualities flowed from thence, we could, by the specific ideas of their real essences in our own minds, more certainly find out their properties and discover what qualities they had or had not than we can now by our senses. And to know the properties of gold, it would be no more necessary that gold should exist and that we should make experiments upon it than it is necessary for the knowing the properties of a triangle that a triangle should exist in any matter. The idea in our minds would serve for the one as well as the other. But we are so far from being admitted into the secrets of nature that we scarce so much as ever approach the first entrance towards them. For we are wont to consider the substances we meet with, each of them, as an entire thing by itself, having all its qualities in itself and independent of other things, overlooking, for the most part, the operations of those invisible fluids they are encompassed with, and upon whose motions and operations depend the greatest part of those qualities which are taken notice of in them, and are made by us the inherent marks of distinction whereby we know and denominate them. Put a piece of gold anywhere by itself, separate from the reach and influence of all other bodies, it will immediately lose all its color and weight, and perhaps malleableness too, which, for aught I know, would be changed into a perfect friability. Water, in which to us fluidity is an essential quality, left to itself, would cease to be fluid. But if inanimate bodies owe so much of their present state to other bodies without them, that they would not be what they appear to us were those bodies that environ them removed, it is yet more so in vegetables, which are nourished, grow, and produce leaves, flowers, and seeds in a constant succession. And if we look a little nearer into the state of animals, we shall find that their dependence as to life, motion, and the most considerable qualities to be observed in them is so wholly on extrinsical causes and qualities of other bodies that make no part of them that they cannot subsist a moment without them, though yet those bodies on which they depend are little taken notice of and make no part of the complex idea we frame of those animals. Take the air but for a minute from the greatest part of living creatures, and they presently lose sense, life, and motion. This the necessity of breathing has forced into our knowledge. But how many other extrinsical and possibly very remote bodies do the springs of these admirable machines depend on, which are not vulgarly observed or so much as thought on, and how many are there which the severest inquiry can never discover. The inhabitants of this spot of the universe, though removed so many millions of miles from the sun, yet depend so much on the duly tempered motion of particles coming from or agitated by it that were this earth removed but a small part of the distance out of its present situation and placed a little further or nearer that source of heat, it is more than probable that the greatest part of the animals in it would immediately perish, since we find them so often destroyed by an excess or defect of the sun's warmth. 
which an accidental position in some parts of this, our little globe, exposes them to. The qualities observed in a lodestone must needs have their source far beyond the confines of that body, and the ravage made often on several sorts of animals by invisible causes the certain death, as we are told, of some of them, by barely passing the line, or, as it is certain of other, by being removed into a neighboring country, evidently show that the concurrence and operations of several bodies with which they are seldom thought to have anything to do is absolutely necessary to make them be what they appear to us and to preserve those qualities by which we know and distinguish them. We are then quite out of the way when we think that things contain within themselves the qualities that appear to us in them, and we in vain search for that constitution within the body of a fly or an elephant upon which depend those qualities and powers we observe in them for which, perhaps, to understand them aright, we ought to look not only beyond this our earth and atmosphere, but even beyond the sun or remotest star our eyes have yet discovered. For how much the being and operation of particular substances in this our globe depends on causes utterly beyond our view is impossible for us to determine we see and perceive some of the motions and grosser operations of things here about us, but whence the streams come that keep all these curious machines in motion and repair, how conveyed and modified is beyond our notice and apprehension, and the great parts and wheels, as I may so say, of this stupendous structure of the universe may for aught we know, have such a connection and dependence in their influence and operations one upon another that perhaps things in this our mansion would put on quite another face and cease to be what they are if some one of the stars or great bodies incomprehensibly remote from us should cease to be or move as it does. This is certain. Things, however absolute and entire they seem in themselves, are but retainers to other parts of nature for that which they are most taken notice of by us. Their observable qualities, actions, and powers are owing to something without them, and there is not so complete and perfect a part that we know of nature which does not owe the being it has and the excellence of it, to its neighbors. And we must not confine our thoughts within the surface of any body, but look a great deal further to comprehend perfectly those qualities that are in it. 12. Our nominal essences of substances furnish few universal propositions about them that are certain. If this be so, it is not to be wondered that we have very imperfect ideas of substances, and that the real essences on which depend their properties and operations are unknown to us. We cannot discover so much as that size, figure, and texture of their minute and active parts, which is really in much less the different motions and impulses made in and upon them by bodies from without, upon which depends and by which is formed the greatest and most remarkable part of those qualities we observe in them, and of which our complex ideas of them are made up. This consideration alone is enough to put an end to all our hopes of ever having the ideas of their real essences, which, whilst we want, the nominal essences we make use of instead of them will be able to furnish us, but very sparingly, with any general knowledge or universal propositions capable of real certainty. 
13. Judgment of probability concerning substances may reach further, but that is not knowledge. We are not therefore to wonder if certainty be to be found in very few general propositions made concerning substances. Our knowledge of their qualities and properties goes very seldom further than our senses reach and inform us. Possibly, inquisitive and observing men may, by strength of judgment, penetrate further and, on probabilities taken from wary observation and hints well laid together, often guess right at what experience has not yet discovered to them. But this is but guessing still. It amounts only to opinion and has not that certainty which is requisite to knowledge, for all general knowledge lies only in our own thoughts and consists barely in the contemplation of our own abstract ideas. Whenever we perceive any agreement or disagreement amongst them, there we have general knowledge, and by putting the names of those ideas together accordingly in propositions, can with certainty pronounce general truths. But, because the abstract ideas of substances for which their specific names stand, whenever they have any distinct and determinate signification, have a discoverable connection or inconsistency with but a very few other ideas, the certainty of universal propositions concerning substances is very narrow and scanty in that part which is our principal inquiry concerning them. And there are scarce any of the names of substances, let the idea it is applied to be what it will, of which we can generally and with certainty pronounce that it has or has not this or that other quality belonging to it and constantly coexisting or inconsistent with that idea wherever it is to be found. 14. What is requisite for our knowledge of substances? Before we can have any tolerable knowledge of this kind, we must first know what changes the primary qualities of one body do regularly produce in the primary qualities of another, and how. Secondly, we must know what primary qualities of any body produce certain sensations or ideas in us. This is, in truth, no less than to know all the effects of matter under its diverse modifications of bulk, figure, cohesion of parts, motion, and rest which I think everybody will allow, is utterly impossible to be known by us without revelation. Nor, if it were revealed to us what sort of figure, bulk, and motion of corpuscles would produce in us the sensation of a yellow color, and what sort of figure, bulk, and texture of parts in the superficies of any body were fit to give such corpuscles their due motion to produce that color, would that be enough to make universal propositions with certainty concerning the several sorts of them, unless we had faculties acute enough to perceive the precise bulk, figure, texture, and motion of bodies in those minute parts by which they operate on our senses so that we might by those frame our abstract ideas of them. I have mentioned here only corporeal substances whose operations seem to lie more level to our understandings. For as to the operations of spirits, both their thinking and moving of bodies, we at first sight find ourselves at a loss though perhaps, when we have applied our thoughts a little nearer to the consideration of bodies and their operations, and examine how far our notions 
even in these reach with any clearness beyond sensible matter of fact, we shall be bound to confess that even in these two our discoveries amount to very little beyond perfect ignorance and incapacity. 15. Whilst our complex ideas of substances contain no ideas of their real constitutions, we can make but few general propositions concerning them. This is evident. The abstract complex ideas of substances, for which their general names stand not comprehending their real constitutions, can afford us very little universal certainty because our ideas of them are not made up of that on which those qualities we observe in them and would inform ourselves about do depend, or with which they have any certain connection. V.G., let the ideas to which we give the name man be, as it commonly is, a body of the ordinary shape with sense, voluntary motion, and reason joined to it. This being the abstract idea, and consequently the essence of our species, man, we can make but very few general certain propositions concerning man standing for such an idea. Because not knowing the real constitution on which sensation, power of motion and reasoning with that particular shape depend, and whereby they are united together in the same subject, there are very few other qualities with which we can perceive them to have a necessary connection, and therefore we cannot with certainty affirm that all men sleep by intervals, that no man can be nourished by wood or stones, that all men will be poisoned by hemlock, because these ideas have no connection nor repugnancy with this our nominal essence of man, with this abstract idea that name stands for. We must in these and the like appeal to trial in particular subjects, which can reach but a little way. We must content ourselves with probability in the rest, but can have no general certainty whilst our specific idea of man contains not that real constitution which is the root wherein all his inseparable qualities are united and from whence they flow. Whilst our idea, the word man, stands for, is only an imperfect collection of some sensible qualities and powers in him, there is no discernible connection or repugnance between our specific idea and the operation of either the parts of hemlock or stones upon his constitution. There are animals that safely eat hemlock, and others that are nourished by wood and stones. But as long as we want ideas of those real constitutions of different sorts of animals whereon these and the like qualities and powers depend, we must not hope to reach certainty in universal propositions concerning them. Those few ideas only which have a discernible connection with our nominal essence, or any part of it, can afford us such propositions. But these are so few, and of so little moment, that we may justly look on our certain general knowledge of substances as almost none at all. 16. Wherein lies the general certainty of propositions? To conclude, general propositions, of what kind soever, are then only capable of certainty when the terms used in them stand for such ideas whose agreement or disagreement, as there expressed, is capable to be discovered by us. And we are then certain of their truth or falsehood when we perceive the ideas the terms stand for to agree or not agree 
according as they are affirmed or denied one of another. Whence we may take notice that general certainty is never to be found but in our ideas. Whenever we go to seek it elsewhere, in experiment or observations without us, our knowledge goes not beyond particulars. It is the contemplation of our own abstract ideas that alone is able to afford us general knowledge. End of section 7「Section 8 of An Essay Concerning Human Understanding」by John Locke Book 4 of Knowledge and Probability This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Henry Chapter 7 Of Maxims 1. Maxims, or axioms, are self-evident propositions. There are a sort of propositions which, under the name of maxims and axioms, have passed for principles of science, and because they are self-evident, have been supposed innate, without that anybody that I know ever went about to show the reason and foundation of their clearness or cogency. It may, however, be worth while to inquire into the reason of their evidence and see whether it be peculiar to them alone, and also to examine how far they influence and govern our other knowledge. 2. Wherein that self-evidence consists. Knowledge, as has been shown, consists in the perception of the agreement or disagreement of ideas. Now where that agreement or disagreement is perceived immediately by itself, without the intervention or help of any other, there our knowledge is self-evident. This will appear to be so to any who will but consider any of those propositions which, without any proof, he assents to at first sight. For in all of them he will find that the reason of his assent is from that agreement or disagreement which the mind, by an immediate comparing them, finds in those ideas answering the affirmation or negation in the proposition. 3. Self-evidence not peculiar to received axioms. This being so, in the next place let us consider whether this self-evidence be peculiar only to those propositions which commonly pass under the name of maxims and have the dignity of axioms allowed them and here it is plain that several other truths not allowed to be axioms partake equally with them in this self-evidence. This we shall see if we go over these several sorts of agreement or disagreement of ideas which I have above mentioned, viz. identity, relation, coexistence, and real existence, which will discover to us that not only those few propositions which have had the credit of maxims are self-evident, but a great many, even almost an infinite number of other propositions are such. 4. As to identity and diversity, all propositions are equally self-evident. 1. For first, the immediate perception of the agreement or disagreement of identity being founded in the mind's having distinct ideas, this affords us as many self-evident propositions as we have distinct ideas. Everyone that has any knowledge at all has as the foundation of it various and distinct ideas, and it is the first act of the mind, without which it can never be capable of any knowledge, to know every one of its ideas by itself and distinguish it from others. Every one finds in himself that he knows the ideas he has, that he knows also when any one is in his understanding and what it is, and that when more than one are there, he knows them distinctly and unconfusedly, one from another. Which always being so, it being impossible but that he should perceive what he perceives, he can never be in doubt when any idea is in his mind, that it is there, 
and is that idea it is, and that two distinct ideas, when they are in his mind, are there, and are not one and the same idea, so that all such affirmations and negations are made without any possibility of doubt, uncertainty, or hesitation, and must necessarily be assented to as soon as understood, that is, as soon as we have in our minds determined ideas which the terms in the proposition stand for. And therefore, whenever the mind with attention considers any proposition so as to perceive the two ideas signified by the terms, and affirmed or denied one of the other to be the same or different, it is presently and infallibly certain of the truth of such a proposition, and this equally whether these propositions be in terms standing for more general ideas, or such as are less so, v.g. whether the general idea of being be affirmed of itself, as in this proposition, whatsoever is, is, or a more particular idea be affirmed of itself, as a man is a man, or whatsoever is white is white or whether the idea of being in general be denied of not being, which is the only, if I may so call it, idea different from it. As in this other proposition, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. Or any idea of any particular being be denied of another different from it, as a man is not a horse, red is not blue. The difference of the ideas, as soon as the terms are understood, makes the truth of the proposition presently visible, and that with an equal certainty and easiness in the less as well as the more general propositions, and all for the same reason, viz. because the mind perceives in any ideas that it has the same idea to be the same with itself, and to different ideas to be different and not the same, and this it is equally certain of, whether these ideas be more or less general, abstract, and comprehensive. It is not, therefore, alone to these two general propositions, whatsoever is, is, and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, that this sort of self-evidence belongs by any peculiar right. The perception of being or not being belongs no more to these vague ideas signified by the terms whatsoever and thing than it does to any other ideas, these two general maxims amounting to no more, in short, but this, that the same is the same and the same is not different, are truths known in more particular instances as well as in those general maxims, and known also in particular instances before these general maxims are ever thought on, and draw all their force from the discernment of the mind employed about particular ideas. There is nothing more visible than that the mind without the help of any proof or reflection on either of these general propositions perceives so clearly and knows so certainly that the idea of white is the idea of white and not the idea of blue, and that the idea of white, when it is in the mind, is there and is not absent, that the consideration of these axioms can add nothing to the evidence or certainty of its knowledge, just so it is, as everyone may experiment in himself, in all the ideas a man has in his mind. He knows each to be itself, and not to be another, and to be in his mind and not away when it is there, with a certainty that cannot be greater, and therefore the truth of no general proposition can be known with a greater certainty, nor add anything to this, so that, in respect of identity, our intuitive knowledge reaches as far as our ideas, and we are capable of making as many self-evident propositions as we have names for distinct ideas. And I appeal to everyone's own mind whether this proposition, a circle is a circle, be not as self-evident a proposition as that consisting of more general terms, whatsoever is, is. And again, whether this proposition, blue 
is not read, be not a proposition that the mind can no more doubt of, as soon as it understands the words, than it does of that axiom, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, and so of all the like. 5. In coexistence, we have few self-evident propositions. 2. Secondly, as to coexistence, or such a necessary connection between two ideas that in the subject where one of them is supposed, there the other must necessarily be also, of such agreement or disagreement as this, the mind has an immediate perception, but in very few of them, and therefore in this sort we have but very little intuitive knowledge, nor are there to be found very many propositions that are self-evident, though some there are. V.G., the idea of filling a place equal to the contents of its superficies, being annexed to our idea of body, I think it is a self-evident proposition that two bodies cannot be in the same place. 6. 3. In other relations we may have many. Thirdly, as to the relations of modes, mathematicians have framed many axioms concerning that one relation of equality, as equals taken from equals the remainder will be equal, which, with the rest of that kind, however they are received for maxims by the mathematicians, and are unquestionable truths, yet I think that any one who considers them will not find that they have a clearer self-evidence than these, that one and one are equal to two, that if you take from the five fingers of one hand two, and from the five fingers of the other hand two, the remaining numbers will be equal. These, and a thousand other such propositions, may be found in numbers, which, at the very first hearing, force the assent and carry with them an equal, if not greater, clearness than those mathematical axioms. 7. 4. Concerning real existence, we have none. Fourthly, as to real existence, since that has no connection with any other of our ideas but that of ourselves and of a first being, we have in that concerning the real existence of all other beings, not so much as demonstrative, much less a self-evident knowledge. And therefore, concerning those, there are no maxims. 8. These axioms do not much influence our other knowledge. In the next place, let us consider what influence these received maxims have upon the other parts of our knowledge. The rules established in the schools, that all reasonings are ex precognitis et preconcessis, seem to lay the foundation of all other knowledge in these maxims, and to suppose them to be precognita, whereby I think are meant these two things. First, that these axioms are those truths that are first known to the mind, and secondly, that upon them the other parts of our knowledge depend. 9. Because maxims, or axioms, are not the truths we first knew. First, that they are not the truths first known to the mind is evident to experience, as we have shown in another place. Book 1, Chapter 1. Who perceives not that a child certainly knows that a stranger is not its mother, that its sucking bottle is not the rod, long before he knows that it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. And how many truths are there about numbers which it is obvious to observe that the mind is perfectly acquainted with and fully convinced of before it ever thought on these general maxims to which mathematicians, in their arguings, do sometimes refer them, whereof the reason is very plain, for that which makes the mind assent to such propositions, being nothing else but the perception it has of the agreement or disagreement of its ideas, 
according as it finds them affirmed or denied one of another in words it understands, and every idea being known to be what it is, and every two distinct ideas being known not to be the same, it must necessarily follow that such self-evident truths must be first known which consist of ideas that are first in the mind. And the ideas first in the mind, it is evident, are those of particular things, from whence, by slow degrees, the understanding proceeds to some few general ones, which, being taken from the ordinary and familiar objects of sense, are settled in the mind with general names to them. Thus, particular ideas are first received and distinguished and so knowledge got about them, and next to them the less general or specific, which are next to particular. For abstract ideas are not so obvious or easy to children or the yet unexercised mind as particular ones. If they seem so to grown men, it is only because by constant and familiar use they are made so. For when we nicely reflect upon them, we shall find that general ideas are fictions and contrivances of the mind that carry difficulty with them and do not so easily offer themselves as we are apt to imagine. For example, does it not require some pains and skill to form the general idea of a triangle, which is yet none of the more abstract, comprehensive, and difficult? For it must be neither oblique nor rectangle, neither equilateral, equicrural, nor scalenon, but all and none of these at once. In effect, it is something imperfect that cannot exist, an idea wherein some part of several different and inconsistent ideas are put together. It is true, the mind, in this imperfect state, has need of such ideas, and makes all the haste to them it can, for the conveniency of communication and enlargement of knowledge, to both which it is naturally very much inclined. But yet one has reason to suspect such ideas are marks of our imperfection. At least this is enough to show that the most abstract and general ideas are not those that the mind is first and most easily acquainted with, nor such as its earliest knowledge is conversant about. 10 because on perception of them the other parts of our knowledge do not depend. Secondly, from what has been said it plainly follows that these magnified maxims are not the principles and foundations of all our other knowledge. For if there be a great many other truths which have as much self-evidence as they, and a great many that we know before them, it is impossible they should be the principles from which we deduce all other truths. Is it impossible to know that one and two are equal to three, but by virtue of this or some such axiom, viz. the whole is equal to all its parts taken together? Many a one knows that one and two are equal to three without having heard or thought on that or any other axiom by which it might be proved, and knows it as certainly as any other man knows that the whole is equal to all its parts, or any other maxim, and all from the same reason of self-evidence, the equality of those ideas being as visible and certain to him without that or any other axiom as with it, it needing no proof to make it perceived nor after the knowledge that the whole is equal to all its parts does he know that one and two are equal to three better or more certainly than he did before for if there be any odds in those ideas the whole and parts are more obscure or at least more difficult to be settled in the mind than those of one two and three and indeed i think i may ask these men who will needs have all knowledge besides those general principles themselves, to depend on general, innate, and self-evident principles. What principle is requisite to prove that one and one are two, that two and two are four, 
that three times two are six, which being known without any proof do evince that either all knowledge does not depend on certain precognita or general maxims called principles, or else that these are principles, and if these are to be counted principles, a great part of numeration will be so, to which, if we add all the self-evident propositions which may be made about all our distinct ideas, principles will be almost infinite, at least innumerable, which men arrive to the knowledge of at different ages, and a great many of these innate principles they never come to know all their lives. But whether they come in view of the mind earlier or later, this is true of them, that they are all known by their native evidence, are wholly independent, receive no light, nor are capable of any proof one from another, much less the more particular from the more general, or the more simple from the more compounded, the more simple and less abstract being the most familiar, and the easier and earlier apprehended. But whichever be the clearest ideas, the evidence and certainty of all such propositions is in this, that a man sees the same idea to be the same idea, and infallibly perceives two different ideas to be different ideas. For when a man has in his understanding the ideas of one and of two, the idea of yellow and the idea of blue, he cannot but certainly know that the idea of one is the idea of one and not the idea of two, and that the idea of yellow is the idea of yellow and not the idea of blue. For a man cannot confound the ideas in his mind which he has distinct. That would be to have them confused and distinct at the same time, which is a contradiction. And to have none distinct is to have no use of our faculties, to have no knowledge at all. And therefore, what idea soever is affirmed of itself, or whatsoever two entire distinct ideas are denied one of another, the mind cannot but assent to such a proposition as infallibly true as soon as it understands the terms, without hesitation or need of proof, or regarding those made in more general terms and called maxims. 11. What use these general maxims or axioms have? What shall we then say? Are these general maxims of no use? By no means, though perhaps their use is not that which it is commonly taken to be, but since doubting in the least of what hath been by some men ascribed to these maxims may be apt to be cried out against as overturning the foundations of all the sciences, it may be worth while to consider them with respect to other parts of our knowledge, and examine more particularly to what purposes they serve and to what not. Of no use to prove less general propositions nor as foundations on consideration of which any science has been built. 1. It is evident from what has been already said that they are of no use to prove or confirm less general self-evident propositions. 2. It is as plain that they are not nor have been the foundations whereon any science hath been built. There is, I know, a great deal of talk propagated from scholastic men of sciences and the maxims on which they are built. But it has been my ill luck never to meet with any such sciences, much less any one built upon these two maxims, what is, is, and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. And I would be glad to be shown where any such science erected upon these or any other general axioms is to be found and should be obligated to any one who would lay before me the frame and system of any science so built on these or any such like maxims that could not be shown to stand as firm without any consideration of them, I ask whether these general maxims have not the same use in the study of divinity and in theological questions that they have in other sciences, 
They serve here, too, to silence wranglers and put an end to dispute. But I think that nobody will therefore say that the Christian religion is built upon these maxims or that the knowledge we have of it is derived from these principles. It is from revelation we have received it. And without revelation, these maxims had never been able to help us to it. When we find out an idea by whose intervention we discover the connection of two others, this is a revelation from God to us by the voice of reason, for we then come to know a truth that we did not know before. When God declares any truth to us, this is a revelation to us by the voice of His Spirit, and we are advanced in our knowledge. But in neither of these do we receive our light or knowledge from maxims. But in the one, the things themselves afford it, and we see the truth in them by perceiving their agreement or disagreement. In the other, God himself affords it immediately to us, and we see the truth of what he says in his unerring veracity. 3. Nor as helps in the discovery of yet unknown truths. They are not of use to help men forward in the advancement of sciences or new discoveries of yet unknown truths. Mr. Newton, in his Never Enough to be Admired book, has demonstrated several propositions, which are so many new truths before unknown to the world, and are further advances in mathematical knowledge. But for the discovery of these, it was not the general maxims what is, is, or the whole is bigger than a part, or the like, that helped him. These were not the clues that led him into the discovery of the truth and certainty of those propositions, nor was it by them that he got the knowledge of those demonstrations, but by finding out intermediate ideas that showed the agreement or disagreement of the ideas as expressed in the propositions he demonstrated, this is the greatest exercise and improvement of human understanding in the enlarging of knowledge and advancing the sciences, wherein they are far enough from receiving any help from the contemplation of these or the like magnified maxims. Would those who have this traditional admiration of these propositions that they think no step can be made in knowledge without the support of an axiom no stone laid in the building of the sciences without a general maxim, but distinguish between the method of acquiring knowledge and of communicating it, between the method of raising any science and that of teaching it to others as far as it is advanced. They would see that those general maxims were not the foundations on which the first discoverers raised their admirable structures, nor the keys that unlocked and opened those secrets of knowledge. Though afterwards, when schools were erected and sciences had their professors to teach what others had found out, they often made use of maxims, i.e. laid down certain propositions which were self-evident or to be received for true, which being settled in the minds of their scholars as unquestionable verities, they on occasion made use of to convince them of truths in particular instances that were not so familiar to their minds as those general axioms which had before been inculcated to them and carefully settled in their minds. Though these particular instances, when well reflected on, are no less self-evident to the understanding than the general maxims brought to confirm them. And it was in those particular instances that the first discoverer found the truth, without the help of the general maxims, and so may anyone else do who with attention considers them. Maxims of use in the exposition of what has been discovered and in silencing obstinate wranglers to come, therefore, to the use that is made of maxims. 1. They are of use, as has been observed, in the ordinary methods of teaching sciences as far as they are advanced, but of little or none in advancing them further. 2. They are of use in disputes, 
for the silencing of obstinate wranglers and bringing those contests to some conclusion. Whether a need of them to that end came not in the manner following, I crave leave to inquire. The schools, having made disputation the touchstone of men's abilities and the criterion of knowledge, educated victory to him that kept the field, and he that had the last word was concluded to have the better of the argument, if not of the cause. But because by this means there was like to be no decision between skilful combatants, whilst one never failed of a medius terminus to prove any proposition, and the other could as constantly, without or with a distinction, deny the major or minor to prevent, as much as could be, running out of disputes into an endless train of syllogisms, certain general propositions, most of them indeed self-evident, were introduced into the schools, which, being such as all men allowed and agreed in, were looked on as general measures of truth, and served instead of principles, where the disputants had not lain down any other between them, beyond which there was no going, and which must not be receded from by either side. And thus these maxims, getting the name of principles, beyond which men in dispute could not retreat, were by mistake taken to be the originals and sources from whence all knowledge began, and the foundations whereon the sciences were built. Because when in their disputes they came to any of these, they stopped there and went no further. The matter was determined. But how much this is a mistake hath already been shown. How maxims came to be so much in vogue. This method of the schools which have been thought the fountains of knowledge, introduced, as I suppose, the like use of these maxims into a great part of conversation out of the schools, to stop the mouths of cavaliers, whom any one is excused from arguing any longer with, when they deny these general self-evident principles received by all reasonable men who have once thought of them, but yet their use herein is but to put an end to wrangling. They, in truth, when urged in such cases, teach nothing. That is already done by the intermediate ideas made use of in the debate, whose connection may be seen without the help of those maxims, and so the truth known before the maxim is produced, and the argument brought to a first principle. Men would give off a wrong argument before it came to that, if in their disputes they proposed to themselves the finding and embracing of truth, and not a contest for victory. And thus maxims have their use to put a stop to their perverseness, whose ingenuity should have yielded sooner. But the method of the schools, having allowed and encouraged men to oppose and resist evident truth till they are baffled, i.e., till they are reduced to contradict themselves or some established principles, it is no wonder that they should not in civil conversation be ashamed of that which in the schools is counted a virtue and a glory, viz. obstinacy to maintain that side of the question they have chosen, whether true or false, to the last extremity, even after conviction, a strange way to attain truth and knowledge and that which I think the rational part of mankind, not corrupted by education, could scarce believe should ever be admitted amongst the lovers of truth, and students of religion or nature, or introduced into the seminaries of those who are to propagate the truths of religion or philosophy amongst the ignorant and unconvinced. How much such a way of learning is like to turn young men's minds from the sincere search and love of truth, nay, and to make them doubt whether there is any such thing, or at least worth the adhering to, I shall not now inquire. This, I think, that baiting those places which brought the peripatetic philosophy into their schools, where it continued many ages, without teaching the world anything but the art of wrangling, 
These maxims were nowhere thought to the foundations on which the sciences were built, nor the great helps to the advancement of knowledge. Of great use to stop wranglers in disputes, but of little use to the discovery of truths. As to these general maxims, therefore, they are, as I have said, of great use in disputes, to stop the mouths of wranglers, but not of much use to the discovery of unknown truths, or to help the mind forwards in its search after knowledge. For who ever began to build his knowledge on this general proposition? What is, is, or it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. And from either of these, as from a principle of science, deduced a system of useful knowledge. Wrong opinions often involving contradictions, one of these maxims as a touchstone may serve well to show whither they lead. But yet, however fit to lay open the absurdity or mistake of a man's reasoning or opinion, they are of very little use for enlightening the understanding, and it will not be found that the mind receives much help from them in its progress in knowledge, which would be neither less nor less certain, were these two general propositions never thought on. It is true, as I have said, they sometimes serve in argumentation to stop a wrangler's mouth by showing the absurdity of what he saith and by exposing him to the shame of contradicting what all the world knows, and he himself cannot but own to be true. But it is one thing to show a man that he is in an error, and another to put him in possession of truth. And I would fain know what truths these two propositions are able to teach, and by their influence make us know which we did not know before, or could not know without them. Let us reason from them, as well as we can, they are only about identical predications and influence, if any at all, none but such. Each particular proposition concerning identity or diversity is as clearly and certainly known in itself, if attended to, as either of these general ones. Only these general ones, as serving in all cases, are therefore more inculcated and insisted on as to other, less general maxims, many of them are no more than bare verbal propositions, and teach us nothing but the respect and import of names one to another. The whole is equal to all its parts. What real truth, I beseech you, does it teach us? What more is contained in that maxim than what the signification of the word totem, or the whole, does of itself import, and he that knows that the word whole stands for what is made up of all its parts, knows very little less than that the whole is equal to all its parts. And upon the same ground, I think that this proposition, a hill is higher than a valley, and several the like, may also pass for maxims. But yet, masters of mathematics, when they would, as teachers of what they know, initiate others in that science, do not, without reason, place this and some other such maxims at the entrance of their systems, that their scholars, having in the beginning perfectly acquainted their thoughts with these propositions, made in such general terms, may be used to make such reflections, and have these more general propositions, as formed rules and sayings, ready to apply to all particular cases. Not that if they be equally weighed, they are more clear and evident than the particular instances they are brought to confirm, but that, being more familiar to the mind, the very naming them is enough to satisfy the understanding. But this, I say, is more from our custom of using them, and the establishment they have got in our minds by our often thinking of them, than from the different evidence of the things. But before custom has settled methods of thinking and reasoning in our minds, I am apt to imagine it is quite otherwise, and that the child, when a part of his apple is taken away, knows it better in that particular instance than by this general proposition, the whole is equal to all its parts. 
and that if one of these have need to be confirmed to him by the other, the general has more need to be let into his mind by the particular than the particular by the general. For in particulars our knowledge begins and so spreads itself by degrees to generals. Footnote. This is the order in time of the conscious acquisition of knowledge that is human. The essay might be regarded as a commentary on this one sentence. Our intellectual progress is from particulars and involuntary recipiency through reactive doubt and criticism into what is at last reasoned faith. Though afterwards, the mind takes the quite contrary course, and having drawn its knowledge into as general propositions as it can, makes those familiar to its thoughts, and accustoms itself to have recourse to them as to the standards of truth and falsehood. Footnote. This is the philosophic attitude. Therein one consciously apprehends the intellectual necessities that were unconsciously presupposed. Its previous intellectual progress in philosophy we draw our knowledge into as general propositions as it can be made to assume and thus either learn to see it as an organic while in a speculative unity or learn that it cannot be so seen in a finite intelligence and that even at the last it must remain broken and mysterious in the human understanding by which familiar use of them as rules to measure the truth of other propositions it comes in time to be thought that more particular propositions have their truth and evidence from their conformity to these more general ones which in discourse and argumentation are so frequently urged and constantly admitted and this i think to be the reason why amongst so many self-evident propositions the most general only have had the title of maxims twelve maxims if care not be taken in the use of words may prove contradictions one thing further i think it may not be amiss to observe concerning these general maxims that they are so far from improving or establishing our minds in true knowledge that if our notions be wrong loose or unsteady and we resign up our thoughts to the sound of words rather than fix them on settled determined ideas of things i say these general maxims will serve to confirm us in mistakes and in such a way of use of words which is most common will serve to prove contradictions v g he that with descartes shall frame in his mind an idea of what he calls body to be nothing but extension may easily demonstrate that there is no vacuum i e no space void of body by this maxim what is is for the idea to which he annexes the name body being bare extension his knowledge that space cannot be without body is certain for he knows his own idea of extension clearly and distinctly and knows that it is what it is and not another idea though it be called by these three names extension body space which three words standing for one and the same idea may no doubt with the same evidence and certainty be affirmed one of another as each of itself and it is as certain that whilst i use them all to stand for one and the same idea this predication is as true and identical in its signification that space is body as this predication is true and identical that body is body both in signification and sound thirteen instance in vacuum but if another should come and make to himself another idea different from descartes of the thing which yet with descartes he calls by the same name body and make his idea which he expresses by the word body 
to be of a thing that hath both extension and solidity together he will as easily demonstrate that there may be a vacuum or space without a body as descartes demonstrated the contrary because the idea to which he gives the name space being barely the simple one of extension and the idea to which he gives the name body being the complex idea of extension and resistibility or solidity together in the same subject these two ideas are not exactly one and the same but in the understanding as distinct as the ideas of one and two white and black or as of corporeity and humanity if i may use those barbarous terms and therefore the predication of them in our minds or in words standing for them is not identical but the negation of them one of another viz this proposition extension or space is not body is as true and evidently certain as this maxim it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be can make any proposition fourteen but they prove not the existence of things without us but yet though both these propositions as you see may be equally demonstrated viz that there may be a vacuum and that there cannot be a vacuum by these two certain principles viz what is is and the same thing cannot be and not be yet neither of these principles will serve to prove to us that any or what bodies do exist for that we are left to our senses to discover to us as far as they can those universal and self-evident principles being only our constant clear and distinct knowledge of our own ideas more general or comprehensive can assure us of nothing that passes without the mind their certainty is founded only upon the knowledge we have of each idea by itself and of its distinction from others about which we cannot be mistaken whilst they are in our minds though we may be and often are mistaken when we retain the names without the ideas or use them confusedly sometimes for one and sometimes for another idea in which cases the force of these axioms reaching only to the sound and not the signification of the words serves only to lead us into confusion mistake and error it is to show men that these maxims however cried up for the great guards of truth will not secure them from error in a careless loose use of their words that i have made this remark in all that is here suggested concerning their little use for the improvement of knowledge or dangerous use in undetermined ideas i have been far enough from saying or intending they should be laid aside as some have been too forward to charge me i affirm them to be truths self-evident truths and so cannot be laid aside as far as their influence will reach it is in vain to endeavor nor will i attempt to abridge it but yet without any injury to truth or knowledge i may have reason to think their use is not answerable to the great stress which seems to be laid on them and i may warn men not to make an ill use of them for the confirming themselves in errors fifteen they cannot add to our knowledge of substances and their application to complex ideas is dangerous but let them be of what use they will in verbal propositions they cannot discover or prove to us the least knowledge of the nature of substances as they are found and exist without us any further than grounded on experience and though the consequence of these two propositions called principles be very clear and their use not dangerous or harmful in the probation of such things wherein there is no need at all of them for proof but such as are clear by themselves without them viz where our ideas are determined and known by the names that stand for them yet when these principles viz 
what is, is, and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, are made use of in the probation of propositions wherein are words standing for complex ideas, v.g. man, horse, gold, virtue, there they are of infinite danger and most commonly make men receive and retain falsehood for manifest truth and uncertainty for demonstration, upon which follow error, obstinacy, and all the mischiefs that can happen from wrong reasoning. The reason whereof is not that these principles are less true or of less force in proving propositions made of terms standing for complex ideas than where the propositions are about simple ideas, but because men mistake generally, thinking that where the same terms are preserved, the propositions are about the same things, though the ideas they stand for are in truth different. Therefore these maxims are made use of to support those which in sound and appearance are contradictory propositions, and is clear in the demonstrations above mentioned about a vacuum, so that whilst men take words for things, as usually they do, these maxims may and do commonly serve to prove contradictory propositions, as shall yet be further made manifest. 16. Instance in demonstrations about man which can only be verbal. For instance, let man be that concerning which you would by these first principles demonstrate anything, and we shall see that so far as demonstration is by these principles, it is only verbal and gives us no certain, universal, true proposition or knowledge of any being existing without us. First, a child, having framed the idea of a man, it is probable that his idea is just like that picture which the painter makes of the visible appearances joined together, and such a complication of ideas together in his understanding makes up the single complex idea which he calls man, whereof white or flesh color in England being one, the child can demonstrate to you that a negro is not a man, because white color was one of the constant simple ideas of the complex idea he calls man, and therefore he can demonstrate by the principle it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be that a negro is not a man. The foundation of his certainty being not that universal proposition which perhaps he never heard nor thought of, but the clear, distinct perception he hath of his own simple ideas of black and white, which he cannot be persuaded to take, nor can ever mistake, one for another, whether he knows that maxim or no. And to this child, or any one who hath such an idea, which he calls man, can you never demonstrate that a man hath a soul, because his idea of man includes no such notion or idea in it, and therefore to him the principle of what is, is, proves not this matter, but it depends upon collection and observation, by which he is to make his complex idea called man. 17. Another instance. Secondly, another that hath gone further in framing and collecting the idea he calls man, and to the outward shape, adds laughter and rational discourse, may demonstrate that infants and changelings are no men. By this maxim, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. And I have discoursed with very rational men who have actually denied that they are men. 18. A third instance. Thirdly, perhaps another makes up the complex idea which he calls man only out of the ideas of body in general, and the powers of language and reason, and leaves out the shape wholly. This man is able to demonstrate that a man may have no hands, but be quadrupes, neither of those being included in his idea of man, and in whatever body or shape he found speech and reason joined, that was a man. 
because having a clear knowledge of such a complex idea, it is certain that what is, is. 19. Little use of these maxims improves where we have clear and distinct ideas, so that, if rightly considered, I think we may say that where our ideas are determined in our minds and have annexed to them by us known and steady names under those settled determinations, there is little need or no use at all of these maxims to prove the agreement or disagreement of any of them. He that cannot discern the truth or falsehood of such propositions without the help of these and the like maxims will not be helped by these maxims to do it, since he cannot be supposed to know the truth of these maxims themselves without proof if he cannot know the truth of others without proof, which are as self-evident as these. Upon this ground, it is that intuitive knowledge neither requires nor admits any proof, one part of it more than another. He that will suppose it does takes away the foundation of all knowledge and certainty, and he that needs any proof to make him certain and give his assent to this proposition, that two are equal to two, will also have need of a proof to make him admit that what is, is. He that needs approbation to convince him that two are not three, that white is not black, that a triangle is not a circle, etc., or any other two determined distinct ideas are not one and the same, will need also a demonstration to convince him that it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. 20. Their use dangerous where our ideas are not determined. And as these maxims are of little use where we have determined ideas, so they are, as I have showed, of dangerous use where our ideas are not determined and where we use words that are not annexed to determined ideas, but such as are of a loose and wandering signification, sometimes standing for one and sometimes for another idea, from which follow mistake and error, which these maxims, brought as proofs to establish propositions, wherein the terms stand for undetermined ideas, do by their authority confirm and rivet. End of section 8 Recording by Jennifer Henry Section 9 of An Essay Concerning Humane Understanding by John Locke Book 4 of Knowledge and Probability This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org chapter eight of trifling propositions one some propositions bring no increase to our knowledge whether the maxims treated of in the foregoing chapter be of that use to real knowledge as is generally supposed i leave to be considered this i think may confidently be affirmed that there are universal propositions which though they be certainly true yet they add no light to our understanding bring no increase to our knowledge such are two as first identical propositions first all purely identical propositions these obviously and at first blush appear to contain no instruction in them for when we affirm the said term of itself whether it be barely verbal or whether it contains any clear and real idea it shows us nothing but what we must certainly know before whether such a proposition be either made by or proposed to us indeed that most general one what is is may serve sometimes to show a man the absurdity he is guilty of when by circumlocution or equivocal terms he would in particular instances deny the same thing of itself because nobody will so openly bid defiance to common sense as to affirm visible and direct contradictions in plain words or if he does a man is excused if he breaks off any further discourse with him 
but yet i think i may say that neither that received maxim nor any other identical proposition teaches us anything and though in such kind of propositions this great and magnified maxim boasted to be the foundation of demonstration may be and often is made use of to confirm them yet all it proves amounts to no more than this that the same word may with great certainty be affirmed of itself without any doubt of the truth of any such proposition and let me add also without any real knowledge three examples for at this rate any very ignorant person who can but make a proposition and knows what he means when he says i or no may make a million of propositions of whose truth he may be infallibly certain and yet not know one thing in the world thereby for instance what is a soul is a soul or a soul is a soul a spirit is a spirit a fetish is a fetish etc these all being equivalent to this proposition namely what is is for instance what hath existence hath existence or who hath a soul hath a soul what is this more than trifling with words it is but like a monkey shifting his oyster from one hand to the other and had he but words might no doubt have said oyster in right hand is subject and oyster in left hand is predicate and so might have made a self-evident proposition of oyster for instance oyster is oyster and yet with all this not have been one whit the wiser or more knowing and that way of handling the matter would much at one have satisfied the monkey's hunger or a man's understanding and they would have improved in knowledge and bulk together for secondly propositions in which a part of any complex idea is predicated of the whole two another sort of trifling propositions is when a part of the complex idea is predicated of the name of the whole a part of the definition of the word defined such are all propositions wherein the genus is predicated of the species or more comprehensive of less comprehensive terms for what information what knowledge carries this proposition in it namely lead is a metal to a man who knows the complex idea the name lead stands for all the simple ideas that go to the complex one signified by the term metal being nothing but what he before comprehended and signified by the name lead indeed to a man that knows the signification of the word metal and not of the word lead it is a shorter way to explain the signification of the word lead by saying it is a metal which at once expresses several of its simple ideas than to enumerate them one by one telling him it is a body very heavy fusible and malleable five as part of the definition of the term defined alike trifling it is to predicate any other part of the definition of the term defined or to affirm any one of the simple ideas of a complex one of the name of the whole complex idea as all gold is fusible for fusibility being one of the simple ideas that goes to the making up the complex one the sound gold stands for what can it be but playing with sounds to affirm that of the name gold which is comprehended in its received signification it would be thought little better than ridiculous to affirm gravely as a truth of moment that gold is yellow and i see not how it is any jot more material to say it is fusible unless that quality be left out of the complex idea of which the sound gold is the mark in ordinary speech what instruction can it carry with it to tell one that which he hath been told already or is he supposed to know before for i am supposed to know the signification of the word another uses to me or else he is to tell me and if i know that the name gold stands for this complex idea of body yellow heavy fusible malleable it will not much instruct me to put it solemnly afterwards in a proposition and gravely say all gold is fusible 
such propositions can only serve to show the disingenuity of one who will go from the definition of his own terms by reminding him sometimes of it but carry no knowledge with them but of the signification of words however certain they may be six instance man and palfrey every man is an animal or living body is as certain a proposition as can be but no more conducing to the knowledge of things than to say a palfrey is an ambling horse or a neighing ambling animal both being only about the signification of words and make me know but this that body sense and motion or power of sensation and moving are three of those ideas that i always comprehend and signify by the word man and when they are not to be found together the name man belongs not to that thing and so of the other that body sense and a certain way of going with a certain kind of voice are some of those ideas which i always comprehend and signify by the word palfrey and when they are not to be found together the name palfrey belongs not to that thing it is just the same and to the same purpose when any term standing for any one or more of the simple ideas that altogether make up that complex idea which is called man is affirmed by the term man for instance suppose a roman signified by the word homo all these distinct ideas united in one subject caporeatus sensibilitus potentia si movendi rationalitus risibilitus he might no doubt with great certainty universally affirm one more or all of these together of the word homo but did no more than say that the word homo in his country comprehended in its signification all these ideas much like a romance knight who by the word palfrey signified these ideas body of a certain figure four-legged with sense motion ambling neighing white used to have a woman on his back might with the same certainty universally affirm also any or all of these of the word palfrey but did thereby teach no more but that the word palfrey in his or romance language stood for all these and was not to be applied to anything where any of these was wanting but he that shall tell me that in whatever thing sense motion reason and laughter were united that thing had actually a notion of god or would be cast into a sleep by opium made indeed an instructive proposition because neither having the notion of god nor being cast into sleep by opium being contained in the idea signified by the word man we are by such propositions taught something more than barely what the word man stands for and therefore the knowledge contained in it is more than verbal seven for this teaches but the signification of words before a man makes any proposition he is supposed to understand the terms he uses in it or else he talks like a parrot only making a noise by imitation and framing certain sounds which he has learnt of others but not as a rational creature using them for signs of ideas which he has in his mind the hearer also is supposed to understand the terms as the speaker uses them or else he talks jargon and makes an unintelligible noise and therefore he trifles with words who makes such a proposition which when it is made contains no more than one of the terms does and which a man was supposed to know before for instance a triangle hath three sides or saffron is yellow and this is no further tolerable than where a man goes to explain his terms to one who is supposed or declares himself not to understand him and then it teaches only the signification of that word and the use of that sign eight but adds no real knowledge we can know then the truth of two sorts of propositions with perfect certainty the one is of those trifling propositions which have a certainty in them but it is only a verbal certainty but not instructive and secondly we can know the truth and so may be certain in propositions 
which affirms something of another which is a necessary consequence of its precise complex idea but not contained in it as that the external angle of all triangles is bigger than either of the opposite internal angles which relation of the outward angle to either of the opposite internal angles making no part of the complex idea signified by the name triangle this is a real truth and conveys with it instructive real knowledge nine general propositions concerning substances are often trifling we have little or no knowledge of what combinations there be of simple ideas existing together in substances but by our senses we cannot make any universal certain propositions concerning them any further than our nominal essences lead us which being to a very few and inconsiderable truths in respect of those which depend on their real constitutions the general propositions that are made about substances if they are certain are for the most part but trifling and if they are instructive are uncertain and such as we can have no knowledge of their real truth how much soever constant observation and analogy may assist our judgment in guessing hence it comes to pass that one may often meet with very clear and coherent discourses that amount yet to nothing for it is plain that names of substantial beings as well as others as far as they have relative significations affixed to them may with great truth be joined negatively and affirmatively in propositions as their relative definitions make them fit to be so joined and propositions consisting of such terms may with the same clearness be deduced one from another as those that convey the most real truths and all this without any knowledge of the nature or reality of things existing without us by this method one may make demonstrations and undoubted propositions in words and yet thereby advance not one jot in the knowledge of the truth of things for instance he that having learnt these following words with their ordinary mutual relative acceptations annexed to them for instance substance man animal form soul vegetative sensitive rational may make several undoubted propositions about the soul without knowing at all what the soul really is and of this sort a man may find an infinite number of propositions reasonings and conclusions in books of metaphysics school divinity and some sort of natural philosophy and after all know as little of god spirits or bodies as he did before he set out ten and why he that hath liberty to define for instance to determine the signification of his names of substances as certainly every one does in effect who makes them stand for his own ideas and it makes their significations at a venture taking them from his own or other men's fancies and not from an examination or inquiry into the nature of things themselves may with little trouble demonstrate them one of another according to those several respects and mutual relations he has given them one to another wherein however things agree or disagree in their own nature he needs mind nothing but his own notions with the names he hath bestowed upon them but thereby no more increases his own knowledge than he does his riches who taking a bag of counters calls one in a certain place a pound another in another place a shilling and a third in a third place a penny and so proceeding may undoubtedly reckon right and cast up a great sum according to his counters so placed and standing for more or less as he pleases without being one jot the richer or without even knowing how much a pound shilling or penny is but only that one is contained in the other twenty times and contains the other twelve which a man may also do in the signification of words by making them in respect of one another more or less or equally comprehensive eleven thirdly using words variously is trifling with them 
though yet concerning most words used in discourses equally argumentative and controversial there is this more to be complained of which is the worst sort of trifling and which sets us yet further from the certainty of knowledge we hope to attain by them or find in them namely that most writers are so far from instructing us in the nature and knowledge of things that they use their words loosely and uncertainly and do not by using them constantly and steadily in the same significations make plain and clear deductions of words one from another and make their discourses coherent and clear how little soever they were instructive which were not difficult to do did they not find it convenient to shelter their ignorance or obstinacy under the obscurity and perplexedness of their terms to which perhaps inadvertency and ill custom do in many men much contribute twelve marks of verbal propositions first predication in abstract to conclude barely verbal propositions may be known by these following marks first all propositions wherein two abstract terms are affirmed one of another are barely about the signification of sounds for since no abstract idea can be the same with any other but itself when its abstract name is affirmed of any other term it can signify no more but this that it may or ought to be called by that name or that these two names signify the same idea thus should any one say that parsimony is frugality that gratitude is justice that this or that action is or is not temperate however specious these and the like propositions may at first sight seem yet when we come to press them and examine nicely what they contain we shall find that it all amounts to nothing but the signification of those terms thirteen secondly a part of the definition predicated of any term secondly all propositions wherein a part of the complex idea which any term stands for is predicated of that term are only verbal for instance to say that gold is a metal or heavy and thus all propositions wherein more comprehensive words called genera are affirmed of subordinate or less comprehensive called species or individuals are barely verbal when by these two rules we have examined the propositions that make up the discourses we ordinarily meet with both in and out of books we shall perhaps find that a greater part of them than is usually suspected are purely about the signification of words and contain nothing in them but the use and application of these signs this i think i may lay down for an infallible rule that wherever the distinct idea any word stands for is not known and considered and something not contained in the idea is not affirmed or denied of it there our thoughts stick wholly in sounds and are able to attain no real truth or falsehood this perhaps if well heeded might save us a great deal of useless amusement and dispute and very much shorten our trouble in wandering in search of real and true knowledge end of section nine section ten of an essay concerning human understanding by john locke book four of knowledge and probability this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter nine of our threefold knowledge of existence one general propositions that are certain concern not existence hitherto we have only considered the essences of things which being only abstract ideas and thereby removed in our thoughts from particular existence that being the proper operation of the mind in abstraction to consider an idea under no other existence but what it has in the understandings gives us no knowledge of real existence at all where by the way we may take notice that universal propositions of whose truth or falsehood 
we can have certain knowledge concern not existence, and further, that all particular affirmations or negations that would not be certain if they were made general are only concerning existence, they declaring only the accidental union or separation of ideas in things existing, which, in their abstract natures, have no known necessary union or repugnancy. 2. A threefold knowledge of existence. But leaving the nature of propositions and different ways of predication to be considered more at large in another place, let us proceed now to inquire concerning our knowledge of the existence of things and how we come by it. I say then that we have the knowledge of our own existence by intuition, of the existence of God by demonstration, and of other things by sensation. 3. Our knowledge of our own existence is intuitive. As for our own existence, we perceive it so plainly and so certainly that it neither needs nor is capable of any proof, for nothing can be more evident to us than our own existence. I think, I reason, I feel pleasure and pain. Can any of these be more evident to me than my own existence? If I doubt all other things, that very doubt makes me perceive my own existence and will not suffer me to doubt of that. For if I know I feel pain, it is evident that I have as certain perception of my own existence as the existence of the pain I feel. Or if I know I doubt, I have as certain perception of the existence of the thing doubting as of that thought which I call doubt. Experience then convinces us that we have an intuitive knowledge of our own existence and an internal, infallible perception that we are. In every act of sensation, reasoning, or thinking, we are conscious to ourselves of our own being, and in this matter come not short of the highest degree of certainty. End of section 10《ซัคชันอีเลฟเอนอูฟแอนเอสเซย์คอนเซอร์นิงฮิวแมนอันดูรสแตนดิ่งบายจอห์นล็อกบุ๊กฟอร์อูฟนอลเลจแอนพรอบบิลิตี้นี่คืออูฟลีบรีวอคส์รีคอร์ดิ่งทุกลีบรีวอคส์รีคอร์ดิ่งส์อูฟในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองในผู้ปกครองใน We are capable of knowing certainly that there is a God. Though God has given us no innate ideas of Himself, though He has stamped no original characters on our minds wherein we may read His being, yet having furnished us with those faculties our minds are endowed with, He hath not left Himself without witness, since we have sense, perception, and reason, and cannot want a clear proof of Him as long as we carry ourselves about us. Nor can we justly complain of our ignorance in this great point, since he has so plentifully provided us with the means to discover and know him, so far as is necessary to the end of our being, and the great concernment of our happiness. But though this be the most obvious truth that reason discovers, and though its evidence be, if I mistake not, equal to mathematical certainty, yet it requires thought and attention. And the mind must apply itself to a regular deduction of it from some part of our intuitive knowledge, or else we shall be as uncertain and ignorant of this as of other propositions which are in themselves capable of clear demonstration. To show, therefore, that we are capable of knowing, i.e., being certain that there is a God, and how we may come by this certainty, I think we need go no further than ourselves. And that undoubted knowledge we have of our own existence. Two, for man knows that he himself exists. I think it is beyond question that man has a clear idea of his own being. He knows certainly he exists, and that he is something. He that can doubt whether he be anything or no, I speak not to, no more than I would argue with pure nothing, or endeavor to convince non-entity that it were something. If any one pretends to be so skeptical as to deny his own existence, for really to doubt of it is manifestly impossible, let him for me enjoy his beloved happiness of being nothing, until hunger or some other pain convince him of the contrary. 
This, then, I think, I may take for a truth, which every one certain knowledge assures him of beyond the liberty of doubting, viz. that he is something that actually exists. 3. He knows also that nothing cannot produce a being, therefore something must have existed from eternity. In the next place, man knows, by an intuitive certainty, that bare nothing can no more produce any real being than it can be equal to two right angles. If a man knows not that non-entity, or the absence of all being, cannot be equal to two right angles, it is impossible that he should know any demonstration in Euclid. If, therefore, we know there is some real being, and that non-entity cannot produce any real being, it is an evident demonstration that from eternity there has been something, since what was not from eternity had a beginning, and what had a beginning must be produced by something else. 4. And that eternal being must be most powerful. Next, it is evident that what had its being and beginning from another must also have all that which is in and belongs to its being from another too. All the powers it has must be owing to and received from the same source. This eternal source, then, of all being, must also be the source and original of all power, and so this eternal being must be also the most powerful. 5. And most knowing. Again, a man finds in himself perception and knowledge. We have then got one step further, and we are certain now that there is not only some being, but some knowing, intelligent being in the world. There was a time, then, when there was no knowing being, and when knowledge began to be, or else there has been also a knowing being from eternity. If it be said there was a time when no being had any knowledge, when that eternal being was void of all understanding, I reply that then it was impossible there should ever have been any knowledge, it being as impossible that things wholly void of knowledge and operating blindly and without any perception should produce a knowing being as it is impossible that a triangle should make itself three angles bigger than two right ones, for it is as repugnant to the idea of senseless matter that it should put into itself sense, perception, and knowledge, as it is repugnant to the idea of a triangle that it should put into itself greater angles than two right ones. 6. And therefore God. Thus from the consideration of ourselves, and what we infallibly find in our own constitutions, our reason leads us to the knowledge of this certain and evident truth, that there is an eternal, most powerful, and most knowing being, which, whether any one will please to call God, it matters not. The thing is evident and from this idea duly considered will easily be deduced all those other attributes which we ought to ascribe to this eternal being. If, nevertheless, any one should be found so senselessly arrogant as to suppose man alone knowing and wise, but yet the product of mere ignorance and chance, and that all the rest of the universe acted only by that blind haphazard, I shall leave him with that very rational and emphatical rebuke of Tully to be considered at his leisure. What can be more sillily arrogant and misbecoming than for a man to think that he has a mind and understanding in him, but yet in all the universe beside there is no such thing? Or that those things, which with the utmost stretch of his reason he can scarce comprehend, should be moved and managed without any reason at all? Quid est enim verius, quam neminem esse opertere, tam stulte arrogantem, ut in cimentem et rationem putet in esse incuelo mundo que non putet? Aut ea quoi vis summa ingeni ratione comprehendat, nulla ratione movieri putet? From what has been said, it is plain to me we have a more certain knowledge of the existence of a God than of anything our senses have not immediately discovered to us. Nay, I presume I may say, that we more certainly know that there is a God than that there is anything else without us. When I say we know, I mean there is such a knowledge within our reach which we cannot miss, if we will but apply our minds to that, as we do to several other inquiries. 7. Our idea of a most perfect being, not the sole proof of a God. 
how far the idea of a most perfect being, which a man may frame in his mind, does or does not prove the existence of a god, I will not here examine. For in the different make of men's tempers and application of their thoughts, some arguments prevail more on one and some on another for the confirmation of the same truth. But yet, I think, this I may say, that it is an ill way of establishing this truth, and silencing atheists, to lay the whole stress of so important a point as this upon that sole foundation, and take some men's having that idea of God in their minds, for it is evident some men have none, and some worse than none, and the most very different, for the only proof of a deity, and out of an over-fondness of that darling invention, cashier, or at least endeavor, to invalidate all other arguments, and forbid us to hearken to those proofs as being weak or fallacious, which our own existence and the sensible parts of the universe offer so clearly and cogently to our thoughts, that I deem it impossible for a considering man to withstand them. For I judge it as certain and clear a truth as can anywhere be delivered, that the invisible things of God are clearly seen from the creation of the world, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Though our own being furnishes us, as I have shown, with an evident and incontestable proof of a deity, and I believe nobody can avoid the cogency of it, who will but as carefully attend to it as to any other demonstration of so many parts, yet this being so fundamental a truth, and of that consequence that all religion and genuine morality depend thereon, I doubt not, but I shall be forgiven by my reader if I go over some parts of this argument again and enlarge a little more upon them. 8. Recapitulation, something from eternity. There is no truth more evident than that something must be from eternity. I never yet heard of any one so unreasonable, or that could suppose so manifest a contradiction as a time wherein there was perfectly nothing. This being of all absurdities the greatest, to imagine that pure nothing, the perfect negation and absence of all beings, should ever produce any real existence. It being, then, unavoidable for all rational creatures to conclude that something has existed from eternity, let us next see what kind of thing that must be. 9. Two sorts of beings, cogitative and incogitative. There are but two sorts of beings in the world that man knows or conceives. First, such as are purely material, without sense, perception, or thought, as the clippings of our beards and parings of our nails. Secondly, sensible, thinking, perceiving beings, such as we find ourselves to be, which, if you please, we will hereafter call cogitative and incogitative beings, which to our present purpose, if for nothing else, are perhaps better terms than material and immaterial. 10. Incogitative being cannot produce a cogitative being. If, then, there must be something eternal, let us see what sort of being it must be. And to that it is very obvious to reason that it must necessarily be a cogitative being. For it is as impossible to conceive that ever bare incogitative matter should produce a thinking, intelligent being as that nothing should of itself produce matter. Let us suppose any parcel of matter eternal, great or small, we shall find it, in itself able to produce nothing. For example, let us suppose the matter of the next pebble we meet, with eternal, closely united, and the parts firmly at rest together. If there were no other being in the world, must it not eternally remain so, a dead, inactive lump? Is it possible to conceive it can add motion to itself, being purely matter, or produce anything? Matter, then, by its own strength, cannot produce in itself so much as motion. The motion it has must also be from eternity, or else be produced and added to matter by some other being more powerful than matter. Matter, as is evident, having not power to produce motion in itself. But let us suppose motion eternal too. Yet matter, incogitative matter and motion, whatever changes it might produce of figure and bulk, could never produce thought. Knowledge will still be as far beyond the power of motion and matter to produce, 
as matter is beyond the power of nothing or non-entity to produce. And I appeal to everyone's own thoughts, whether he cannot as easily conceive matter produced by nothing as thought to be produced by pure matter when, before, there was no such thing as thought or an intelligent being existing? Divide matter into as many parts as you will, which we are apt to imagine a sort of spiritualizing or making a thinking thing of it, vary the figure and motion of it as much as you please, a globe, cube, cone, prism, cylinder, etc., whose diameters are but one hundred thousandth part of a GRY, will operate no otherwise upon other bodies of proportional bulk than those of an inch or foot diameter, and you may as rationally expect to produce sense, thought, and knowledge by putting together, in a certain figure and motion, gross particles of matter as by those that are the very minutest that do anywhere exist. They knock, impel, and resist one another, just as the greater do, and that is all they can do. So that, if we will suppose nothing, first or eternal, matter can never begin to be. If we suppose bare matter without motion, eternal motion can never begin to be. If we suppose only matter and motion first, or eternal, thought can never begin to be. For it is impossible to conceive that matter, either with or without motion, could have, originally, in and from itself, sense, perception, and knowledge, as is evident from hence that then sense, perception, and knowledge must be a property eternally inseparable from matter and every particle of it. Not to add that, though our general or specific conception of matter makes us speak of it as one thing, yet really all matter is not one individual thing, neither is there any such thing existing as one material being or one single body that we know or can conceive. And therefore, if matter were the eternal first cogitative being, there would not be one eternal, infinite cogitative being, but an infinite number of eternal, finite cogitative beings, independent one of another, of limited force and distinct thoughts, which could never produce that order, harmony, and beauty, which are to be found in nature. Since, therefore, whatsoever is the first eternal being must necessarily be cogitative, and whatsoever is first of all things must necessarily contain in it, and actually have, at least, all the perfections that can ever after exist. Nor can it ever give to another any perfection that it hath not either actually in itself, or at least in a higher degree. It necessarily follows that the first eternal being cannot be matter. 11. Therefore there has been an eternal wisdom. If, therefore, it be evident that something necessarily must exist from eternity, it is also as evident that that something must necessarily be a cogitative being, for it is as impossible that incogitative matter should produce a cogitative being as that nothing, or the negation of all being, should produce a positive being or matter. 12. The Attributes of the Eternal Cogitative Being Though this discovery of the necessary existence of a eternal mind does sufficiently lead us into the knowledge of God, since it will hence follow that all other knowing beings that have a beginning must depend on him, and have in other ways of knowledge or extent of power than what he gives them, and therefore, if he made those, he made all the less excellent pieces of this universe, all inanimate beings whereby his omniscience, power, and providence will be established, and all his other attributes necessarily follow yet, to clear this up a little further, we will see what doubt can be raised against it. 13. Whether the eternal mind may be also material or no. First, perhaps it will be said, that though it be as clear as demonstration can make it, that there must be an eternal being, and that being must also be knowing, Yet it does not follow, but that thinking being may also be material. Let it be so, it equally still follows that there is a God. For there be an eternal, omniscient, omnipotent being, it is certain that there is a God, whether you imagine that being to be material or no. But herein, I suppose, lies the danger and deceit of that supposition. 
there being no way to avoid the demonstration that there is an eternal knowing being, men devoted to matter would willingly have it granted that that knowing being is material, and then, letting slide out of their minds or the discourse, the demonstration whereby an eternal knowing being was proved necessarily to exist, would argue all to be matter, and so deny a god that is an eternal cogitative being, whereby they are so far from establishing that they destroy their own hypothesis. For if there can be, in their opinion, eternal matter without any eternal cogitative being, they manifestly separate matter and thinking, and suppose no necessary connection of the one with the other, and so establish the necessity of an eternal spirit, but not of matter, since it has been proved already that an eternal cogitative being is unavoidably to be granted. Now, if thinking and matter may be separated, the eternal existence of matter will not follow from the eternal existence of a cogitative being, and they suppose it to no purpose. 14. Not material. First, because each particle of matter is not cogitative. But now let us see how they can satisfy themselves or others that this eternal thinking being is material. 1. I would ask them whether they imagine that all matter, every particle of matter, thinks. This, I suppose, they will scarce say, since there would be as many eternal thinking beings as there are particles of matter, and so an infinity of gods. And yet, if they will not allow matter as matter, that is, every particle of matter, to be as well cogitative as extended, they will have as hard a task to make out to their own reasons a cogitative being out of incogitative particles, as an extended being out of unextended parts, if I may so speak. 15. 2. Secondly, because one particle alone of matter cannot be cogitative. If all matter does not think, I next ask whether it be only one atom that does so. This has as many absurdities as the other, for then this atom of matter must be alone eternal or not. If this alone be eternal, then this alone, by its powerful thought or will, made all the rest of matter. And so we have the creation of matter by a powerful thought, which is that the materialists stick at. For if they suppose one single thinking atom to have produced all the rest of matter, they cannot ascribe that preeminency to it upon any other account than that of its thinking, the only supposed difference. But allow it to be by some other way which is above our conception, it must still be creation, and these men must give up their great maxim, ex nihilo nil fit. If it be said that all the rest of matter is equally eternal as that thinking atom, it will be to say anything at pleasure, though ever so absurd. For to suppose all matter eternal, and yet one small particle in knowledge and power, infinitely above all the rest, is without any the least appearance of reason to frame an hypothesis. Every particle of matter, as matter, is capable of all the same figures and motions of any other, and I challenge any one in his thoughts to add anything else to one above another. 16. 3. Thirdly, because a system of incogitative matter cannot be cogitative. If then neither one particular atom alone can be this eternal thinking being, nor all matter as matter, i.e. every particle of matter can be it, it only remains that it is some certain system of matter duly put together that is this thinking eternal being. This is that which, I imagine, is that notion which men are aptest to have of God, who would have him a material being as most readily suggested to them by the ordinary conceit they have of themselves and other men which they take to be material thinking beings. But this imagination, however more natural, is no less absurd than the other, for to suppose the eternal thinking being to be nothing else but a composition of particles of matter, each whereof is incogitative, is to ascribe all the wisdom and knowledge of that eternal being only to the juxtaposition of parts, than which nothing can be more absurd. For unthinking particles of matter, however put together, can have nothing thereby added to them but a new relation of position, which it is impossible should give thought and knowledge to them.
17. And whether this corporeal system is in motion or at rest. But further, this corporeal system either has all its parts at rest, or it is a certain motion of the parts wherein its thinking consists. If it be perfectly at rest, it is but one lump, and so can have no privileges above one atom. If it be the motion of its parts on which its thinking depends, all the thoughts there must be unavoidably accidental and limited, since all the particles that by motion cause thought, being each of them in itself without any thought, cannot regulate its own motions, much less be regulated by the thought of the whole, since that thought is not the cause of motion, for then it must be antecedent to it, and so without it, but the consequence of it, whereby freedom, power, choice, and all rational and wise thinking or acting will be quite taken away, so that such a thinking being will be no better nor wiser than pure blind matter, since to resolve all into the accidental unguided motions of blind matter, or into thought depending on unguided motions of blind matter, is the same thing. Not to mention the narrowness of such thoughts and knowledge that must depend on the motion of such parts. But there needs no enumeration of any more absurdities and impossibilities in this hypothesis, however full of them it may be, than that before mentioned. Since, let this thinking system be all or a part of the matter of the universe. It is impossible that any one particle should either know its own, or the motion of any other particle, or the whole know the motion of every particle, and so regulate its own thoughts or motions, or indeed have any thought resulting from such motion. 18. Matter not coeternal with an eternal mind. Secondly, Others would have matter to be eternal, notwithstanding that they allow an eternal, cogitative, immaterial being. This, though it not take away the being of a god, yet since it denies one and the first great piece of his workmanship, the creation, let us consider it a little. Matter must be allowed eternal. Why? Because you cannot conceive how it can be made out of nothing. Why do you not also think yourself eternal? You will answer, perhaps, because about twenty or forty years since you began to be. But if I ask you what that you is, which began then to be, you can scarce tell me. The matter whereof you are made began not then to be, for if it did, then it is not eternal. But it began to be put together in such a fashion and frame as makes up your body. But yet that frame of particles is not you, it makes not the thinking thing you are, for I have now to do with one who allows an eternal, immaterial thinking being, but would have unthinking matter eternal too. Therefore, when did that thinking thing begin to be? If it did never begin to be, then have you always been a thinking thing from eternity, the absurdity whereof I need not confute till I meet with one who is so void of understanding as to own it. If, therefore, you can allow a thinking thing to be made out of nothing, as all things that are not eternal must be, why also can you not allow it possible for a material being to be made out of nothing by an equal power, but that you have the experience of the one in view and not of the other? Though, when well considered, creation of a spirit will be found to require no less power than the creation of matter, nay, possibly, if we would emancipate ourselves from vulgar notions and raise our thoughts as far as they would reach, to a closer contemplation of things, we might be able to aim at some dim and seeming conception how matter might at first be made and begin to exist by the power of that eternal first being. But to give beginning and being to a spirit would be found a more inconceivable effect of omnipotent power. But this being what would perhaps lead us too far from the notions on which the philosophy now in the world is built it would not be pardonable to deviate so far from them, or to inquire, so far as grammar itself would authorize, if the common settled opinion opposes it, especially in this place where the received doctrine serves well enough to our present purpose, and leaves this past doubt that the creation or beginning of any one substance out of nothing, being once admitted the creation of all other but the Creator himself, may, with the same ease, be supposed. 19. Objection. Creation out of nothing. 
But you will say, is it not impossible to admit of the making anything out of nothing, since we cannot possibly conceive it? I answer, no, because it is not reasonable to deny the power of an infinite being, because we cannot comprehend its operations. We do not deny other effects upon this ground, because we cannot possibly conceive the matter of their production. We cannot conceive how anything but impulse of body can move body, and yet that is not a reason sufficient to make us deny it possible against the constant experience we have of it in ourselves, in all our voluntary motions which are produced in us only by the free action or thought of our own minds, and are not, nor can be, the effects of the impulse or determination of the motion of blind matter in or upon our own bodies. For then, it could not be in our power or choice to alter it. For example, my right hand writes, whilst my left hand is still. What causes rest in one and motion in the other? Nothing but my will, a thought of my mind, my thought only changing, the right hand rests, and the left hand moves. This is a matter of fact which cannot be denied. Explain this, and make it intelligible, and then the next step will be to understand creation. For the giving a new determination to the motion of the animal spirits, which some make use of to explain voluntary motion, clears not the difficulty one jot. To alter the determination of motion, being in this case no easier nor less than to give motion itself, since the new determination given to the animal spirits must be either immediately by thought, or by some other body put in their way by thought, which was not in their way before, and so must owe its motion to thought either of which leaves voluntary motion as unintelligible as it was before. In the meantime, it is an overvaluing ourselves to reduce all to the narrow measure of our capacities, and to conclude all things impossible to be done whose manner of doing exceeds our comprehension. This is to make our comprehension infinite, or God finite, when what he can do is limited to what we can conceive of it. If you do not understand the operations of your own finite mind, that thinking thing within you, do not deem it strange that you cannot comprehend the operations of that eternal infinite mind who made and governs all things, and whom the heaven of heavens cannot contain. End of section 11